He's Randy Sherman. I'm Tony Miller. And on today's show, we're talking transition offense and showing you some early offense options that you can use with your team, especially if you're a five out team. You want to stick around to listen to this episode. As mentioned, this is early offense today. You can follow the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag early offense. Randy has a lot of great stuff already out there, but he's going to share with us today some of the stuff. We're going to go through a presentation, give you some fast draw things for you to look at and diagrams. Um, Randy, I think you also have a few things about this on fast model as well, if people are interested oh, yeah. in that. Why don't you kind of just introduce us to what we're going to talk about here, and then we can switch over to the presentation at any time. Yeah, so uh, good to be back. We've had a couple weeks without um, a live episode, um, so good to be back and good to catch up. And um, yeah, so early offense is something that I, I I like and and like to watch teams kind of play through early offense like that, and tried to do sort of uh, facsimiles of with my own team watching you know the old seven seconds or less Phoenix Suns when Mike D'Antoni was their coach and. And uh, man, I, I was in love with that team and the way they played. And now it's pretty commonplace. So that that was revolutionary at that time, but now it's run of the mill. Um, so I would say um, early offense is something I, I used to hear a lot. Like, what what does exactly that mean? And I searched around and read and did some things to sort of like find okay, where if where has someone sort of defined what that phrase means like is it same thing as secondary break is it the same thing as um you know um quick hitter or what what is what does this word mean so i couldn't really find anything so i then i kind of just shifted and kind of made my own definition like since i didn't really find that defined um and and when i did see people attempt i heard different explanations so i kind of just took took a stab of 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 um of what I thought might be a good working definition. And that's just sort of like what happens in the first four to five seconds after we gain possession of the ball, like in our, you know, you know, maybe more pertinent to a shot clock team in college basketball, professional basketball, they sort of like break up that clock into early clock, middle clock, late clock. And um so early offense, I just sort of said, okay, what what do we do first? The four, the first four to five seconds after we, you know, get a rebound, come into the front court, we're playing with maybe a 24 second shot clock or a 30 second shot clock. We got to get to an action to create an advantage right away. So that's that's what I'm talking about when I talk about early offense. Whether that's the correct definition or not, I don't know. That's just sort of what I came up with after sort of scouring around for a, a good working definition. I've seen more coaches talking about this on Twitter, and it's something that I've tried to do and incorporate and thought a lot about this past offseason. But that seamless um, transition mm -hmm. from running down the floor of the definition that you just said with early offense, then how can we transition that seamlessly into our half court offense without that pause in between? And the tactical side of it or the execution aspect of it is yeah. you lose any kind of advantage that you if you don't have a scoring opportunity, then you stop and the defense sits and all advantages. And it's hard to build that and, you know, build that steam back up again mm -hmm. to create yeah. those advantages. So I've found even early in this season for us, being able to have something that goes seamlessly from your transition, what we typically do, however you define that, those first mm -hmm. few seconds naturally into your offense has created a lot more scoring opportunities. And if you're looking to increase the pace of your team and more possessions and up and down faster, this is a very practical way to do that. Yeah, I think it's something that's trickling down from the professional level, seeing more and more of it. So that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. All right, let me go ahead and pull up this slide, then start wherever you want to, Randy, and then um, I'll push it along whenever okay. you tell me. Yeah, so there's our uh, what you're what you're calling up on the screen now, is sort of like our definition. If you like, I like I went over your first question is what is early offense? Like I looked around didn't really find consensus or anything that I felt was a great definition. So I just kind of went with, with uh, the period of time for when we gain possession of the ball to the execution of our first action. Let's just work with that. Um, that at least for this conversation, that's what we're calling early offense. Um, my goal for coaches and my team was, was we get a rebound or we get scored on, we advance the ball 
And let's just use something we're going to talk about later is, is let's just say a drag screen, for example. We're going to talk about and look at some diagrams of those later on in this conversation. Let's just work with that example. It's like within the first four to five seconds, I'm looking for us to get that screen set. Uh, we, we got the rebound. We outlet it or not. Maybe we just advanced with our the guy who rebounded. You know, I'm watching the, the the time clock or the shot clock. If it's clicking down, like we, I can tell how quickly we got to our first action. Um, so uh, that's what we're talking about here. In the first four to five seconds, we want to get to that first action, and in the next sec next second or two, second six or seven, maybe we want to get to, you know, the 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 next one. If the first one didn't, you know, just create you know a layup for us or something or. or um, we want to get to the, you know, or or maybe if it's like handoff that we want to get to that handoff in four seconds, follow it with a ball screen in the next second. So within six to seven seconds, we've gone handoff ball screen. So that's kind of what I'm thinking of when I when for this conversation's sake of what what I mean by early offense. Um, I think the the i don't know the godfather or the the i don't know the 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 person the first coach that comes to my mind when i think of playing like this is mike d'antoni someone we we've mentioned already with the seven seconds or less uh, phoenix suns and his work with the knicks and the rockets and 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 other teams and it's just it's just been a a an influential coach in the basketball world and this is one reason why um the one, one thing that he kind of ran that got copied all throughout the league still is to this day is a 21 series where one and two play together. Um, what you see in that first diagram is like, you know, we're bringing the ball into the front court. One throws ahead to two who's sort of button hooked at the three point line. And then there's just sort of reads and options and reactions off of that pass. The first one being a simple just throw and go chasing the pass right back into a handoff. If uh, two hands it back to one, maybe he's got a corner to turn for a layup. If if two, um, and then the five man who's trailing in that middle lane cleans it up with with a ball screen or a flare screen. In this case, if the ball was handed off to the to the to one, um, if if one took it but couldn't turn the corner to score, they just sort of keep the ball in that corner and they get into a deep a deep uh, side ball screen. So. Um, you know, that's that's a classic example of early offense. We want to get the head to two, maybe get that handoff. That should happen about the four to five second mark. If we need that flare screen or that deep screen like you see in frame two, we're going to get to that in the next second or two. So right in the first six seconds of the shot clock, we've we've hit them with bang, bang. Mm. That's early offense. I've seen especially a lot in that first slide there. The confusion is created because the defense is not already set and teams yeah, really aren't still, very yeah. they're not communicating very well yeah. early on and when you go like consecutive action one two or three of them in a row it usually causes somebody to pause for half a second and that's where you get your hip to hip or that extra step that gives you the advantage for that scoring opportunity yeah these second two frames down here in the in the lower right hand corner would be sort of like playing with the reads and reactions of this 21 series would be to say we hit ahead to two whose button hooked at the three-point line. We run over the top. We don't get the handoff, so we just space to the corner. Five's rule is I'm going to the ball. I'm going to – whatever happens, I'm going to the ball. I'm either going to go screen for the handoff guy, or if he's still got it, I'm ball screening for him. So you see that there um, in, in, the, in frame one of the ones in the lower right-hand corner. Um, you know, he, he two didn't hand it back to one. He keeps it and five just screens for him. So again, bang, bang, we've, we've attempt, we kept, we keep it. That's 21 keep two kept it. So 21 keep is the name of that one. So five goes in ball screens for him. Now we got one on the back action behind the ball screen. If two comes off the ball screen, they can get into dribble weave with four, like you see in frame two. So, um, classic Phoenix Suns, Mike D'Antoni early offense options for five out. Yeah, and then the one in the bottom right there, you're just talking, you end up with that, like, what people call that triple gap where a guy can yep. drive it and either create an advantage for himself or you kind of put the X1 on an island and he's got to decide, do I want to stop the ball or do I want to um, stay with my man over there in the corner? So Yeah, and you got five who in frame one got into pick and roll and then just sort of found that dunker spot playing behind that penetration in case X5 helps over. Um 
can protect the rim. We've got, you know, we can play play a lob to the dunker spot. Yeah. I think you have video of 21 Chase. Again, this isn't a D'Antoni coach team. This is a Miami Heat uh, from a few years ago. Um, but you can see the influence from him throughout the league. So you see there the, the throw – and the, and the chasing of the pass, you saw the guy he hit a head to on the wing, sort of button hooked on that three-point line, um, and and 21 chase. The name being derived from the fact that I throw ahead and just chase my pass right back for a handoff. And, you know, speed, speed is the, you know, ball speed and player speed here is what's going to make it work. You know, that pass being – you know, fired up the sideline and then sprinting to take it back, you know, that's what that pace and speed is what sort of gets that corner turned in all these clips. Uh, you know, this is, this is Dragic who's no longer with them, but, but, um, but, you know, he, he's good about looking ahead and then bursting right into that cut. So that's just a short video of 21 chase. Yeah. I like those. Cause like you said, the guy's going downhill and it kind of puts the, it, Defender at a disadvantage as he's backpedaling or trying to stay in front, you eventually get an advantage somewhere between the free throw line extended and the goal. There's so much space there for the guy to drive and create yeah, some sort that, of scoring opportunity. Yeah, you got that corner empty if he if he's able to make it around. So, again, these are just sort of reads and reactions, not necessarily calls. If we throw it ahead, we might chase. I might hand it back. I might not. If I don't, that turns into keep, and we we just kind of react to what happens. Here, maybe one is advancing the ball and can't throw it ahead to the guy button hook. So he just uses him as like a step up screen to turn the corner for. Uh, so this is the name 21 step. Um, so two and two and one playing together. So hence 21, 21 step would be I'm looking to throw it ahead to him button hooked at the at the three point line. I don't like it. Well, what can we do if I can't throw it ahead to him? I'll just use him as a as a as a blocker, if you will and just use it as a step-up screen. You can remember Steve Nash back in the day kind of coming off of that and turning the corner and, and either, you know, his crafty layups around the rim or kind of playing under the rim and throwing it back out to the three um, or kind of bouncing that out to the corner like you see in frame two. And, and, and again, five's rule is I'm going – I'm screening until I get to the ball. So I'm screening for, for player two, and then I'm going to keep screening. If, if the ball's still in the corner, I'll go and get that deep – that deep wing pick and roll. I was, you know, Nash and Stoudemire come to mind for me when I see these diagrams. So, um, yeah, this is just a read and option out of that. Like if, if I don't want to throw it ahead or he's not open, I can, I can, we can, what can we do? We can go right into the step up game. This one I like a lot. We've used this a lot with the okay. drag and I think even you can, um, a lot of teams are switching this to kind of prevent, the the drag from being as effective but then the counter to that has been we've we've had some success with like ghosting the screen mm -hmm. early on um and so you can even do a lot of stuff out of this but i like the drag that's my early impression from college basketball this year that not to change the subject but the 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 ghost the pick and pop whatever you want to call that like no one can guard it nobody mm -hmm. it's like nobody's able to guard it effectively and and uh and so, yeah, I like that. Um, what are your kind of teaching points in your drag, the drag stuff you guys are doing for your five man? Like, what are you telling him as far as like, uh, you know, timing and all of that? Ours is triggered by usually if we throw it down to the corner and it pops back up, then that's okay. an automatic drag. Um, sometimes it'll be based off like personnel who I have up there. So if we do have a guy who can shoot it, well, we have our, our, our drag guy is uh, uh, a really good shooter, and so uh, he'll usually be the one that ghosts it. That's different from mm -hmm. if I have my seven footer in there. He's usually the roller. Yeah. yeah, he's the roller guy. So, and it, it'll depend on again. That's primarily scout driven. So, if I know it's a team that that is switch that's switching, um, usually in you and I were talking before this, we've got a, another D one game tonight. Like they're not going to be switching that. So that's probably a scenario where we're going to screen it and then roll to the basket and lift up behind it. Yeah, um, like you see there in frame one. Yeah. Yeah. So th those are those are usually the the two that we're using. Um, we don't even like pick and pop anymore. It's usually either screen and roll or just the the ghost screen. Yeah, because it's sort of like a non-contact 
it's yeah. almost like slip to a pop that's ghost yeah and it usually leads to the reason why it's so effective is it's a long east west closeout and it usually will draw the corner guys man up because it's such a long close out for the guy who was involved in the pick and roll. And then you just do the one more pass down to the corner for an open shot. Mm -hmm. That's great, man. Um, yeah. I mean, just the basic, like in frame one, you see here's the drag break that like everyone finding a sideline five man in the middle third of the court, one, one bringing the ball up the alley, no advantage. Like you said, maybe you pass down, it comes back up. The defense matches your depth They're They're organized. They're back. Now we need an action to drag right in to create an advantage. Um, so, or if one, if we go guard keep, or like you see in, in frame one, there, guard didn't pass it ahead. He just dribble advances the ball over the half court line. Defense is back. Let's get, let's get to this drag screen in the first four to five seconds of possession and, and see if we can crack the shell with a, with a pick and roll, either with the dribble penetration or hitting the roller or create, you know, like you said, a throwback to two kind of shaking or replacing behind the drag screen uh, <clears throat> some other kind of drag like options like if you do dribble advance if we don't if we go guard keep in transition and the and the guard brings it over the half court line is like you see in frame two just dribble at player two maybe you get them on a back door cut if not he just continues or she just continues and pushes through to the other corner and again what's five man's rule i'm going to the ball i'm going to screen for the ball like so so they they you get that deep side ball screen with lots of space on the accept side of the screen and, <clears throat> and an empty side um, pick and roll. Um, in the fourth frame, some other sort of drag concepts would be maybe in transition, someone other than our five man rebound rebounded and the five man sort of saw an opportunity perhaps to rim run or run ahead. Like he thought he could run for a layup. So he's not sort of lagging behind the ball, even or behind with it. He's out ahead of the ball and we still go guard keep, but we bring him back out. Like he looked, he ran, he's got his, and it didn't come to him. So he comes back up and we can get like this flat, more step up style um, pick and roll um, there. Um, I like to clear the corner when that happens, if you don't have to, but, but I, I like to, because, um, you know, if it's a right-handed point guard and they want to, you know, maybe use a little hesitate and go and come up that ball screen, let's let's let the guy below that action see that and clear the corner. So we kind of get we kind of get uh, get that side empty for that that empty side drive. For us, um, that's, that serves to like a bigger offensive principle that we use is the the push the push pull. So if he's mm -hmm. dribbling towards you, then you push. Everybody should be pushing in front and everybody behind, like you see there with the three and the four behind, should yes. be pulling towards the yes. guy because that's going to maintain your spacing that you want. Yeah, and we know where our outlets are going to be if that penetration doesn't make it home. and We jump, stop, pivot. We got somebody kind of cutting into our taillights. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the defense is torn between do I help on the pick and roll or uh oh my man's moving like wh which one do I do um do I tag in or help or whatever um yeah so that's a good basketball principle for sure we've uh, had a so lot of success too as the one dribbles to that side once it's cleared out to turn around it and Barkley down in there absolutely. and basically you create um we've also like sent the five back towards the four to like set that crack back screen um I like it so there's the it's the old Villanova. I mean, you can Villanova does this. They Barkley. I I was I knew they did it a lot, but if you watch them, they Barkley a lot, and they Barkley for a lot of seconds, and that's what really frees up a lot of the other actions and the three point opportunities that happen yeah. off the ball. Yeah, they Barkley just for fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like ah, this, this is cool. Let's keep doing this. You know, yeah. like yeah, um, yeah. So the some of the concepts or questions I get about drag screens a lot, like like what do What's my cue? Like, what do we, when do we do it? When do we not? Like things like that. I, I would say, um, you know, when all five defenders are back, like we've, we've, we've brought the ball, we've run to our shape and like, there's really no, nothing cooking here as far as like a, a numbers advantage. Uh, the defense is organized. They're, they're, they're all in front of us. That that's a good cue to go ahead and, and drag, uh, 
I like to see the the, the, the screener, the, the player five. I, I don't have it drawn necessarily as well as I'd like in some of these as far as the angle I want them to achieve. But we want to screen the back pocket of the, the on-ball defender. So sometimes that requires like the ball handler sort of like taking his man down with the dribble and like using his hip to get the guy having a little patience and then getting the drag screen set where we screen the back pocket of the on-ball defender to get him to have to, we want them to go over the screen so we can get downhill penetration. So mm -hmm. just some tips and takeaways. Um, yeah. Like you see here, um, <clears throat> we can go dribble drag, which would be, you know, we can, you know, get another, get a different player other than one and five in the ball screen. Maybe we, we like, you know, the matchup with two and five better or, or, you know, these two defenders have sort of figured it out. Let's put another guy in the pick and roll. So we, we dribble handoff with two. He comes up five drags for him again. What's five's rule? I'm going to the ball. I'm screening for the ball. Like I'm going to do that. Like we've just changed the player who has it by using the dribble handoff on the first side. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I like to think about in terms of early offense and transitions. There's first side and second side. So all the things we talked about today have been first side early offense. Um, mm -hmm. The the next frame you see up top would be. Um, if our personnel is such that like maybe our guards, our wings, our, our smalls hit the corners and both of our bigs are sort of the that next layer of offensive players, like you see here, five and four, we can go double drag right off the, you know, the guy come off the sideline like you see player four there and we get a roll and a pop, maybe maybe first one rolls, second one pops, or you do that based on personnel if if one of your guys is the roller and one of your guys is a popper, you can do that in a different order. But, uh, but um, yeah, double drag can sometimes be uh, an effective sort of change up to that single drag if the personnel works for you. It, the thing I like about it, too, is now we condense three players around the ball <clears throat> with a double drag. And if we are able to turn the corner, we've got our guards pushed all the way and we got more space on the side of the double drag. I like that second guy to get all the way to the midline if he can. I don't like that second screen to be set over here on that side, the left side of the midline in this diagram. Like, Get as close to the midline as you can with your double drag. Sometimes you used to see one take it down a little bit more toward free throw line extended, and the two draggers are almost pointed with their nose in the corner, and, and that creates more space on the accept side of the, the two drag screens especially that first one, dri the dribble drag. I see a ton of teams doing this, both at the NBA level and at the college level. And those actions, the handoff, they have to communicate that. And then typically the guy who switches onto the ball gets stuck up in the ball screen and you end up with some sort of advantage, whether that's a mismatch if they late switch or if the five just the defender X5 can't get out there, the guy can turn the corner and has basically a layup at the rim. Yeah, I call that a combination, like in boxing, like you you don't, you know, you don't knock someone out with your jab, you jab cross. That's a you go pop pop, right? Like that's how you throw combinations, hook, uppercut, things like that. So that's a combination. Hand off ball screen, pop pop, you know, like like a boxer throws two punches in a row and the, the he stuns his opponent, right? So same thing, same principle, pop pop. Jab. I included I included this last diagram here. If yeah. you're watching, you can see the keys and transition. These are very basic and probably look at these like, yeah, I already know that. But knowing that and then your team actually doing that, I found in our first month of the season has been the difference between us having success in the, these early offense opportunities and mm -hmm. not being able to create any kind of advantages. And if you want to go through each of these, you can. Again, like I said, they're super basic and simple. But if you don't do these well, I don't. I found for at least for us, it, it the, whatever actions you have, they just don't work. Completely agree. Like that to me, the the this bullet point list here, keys in transition. That's the whole conversation. That's it. Like like we got to set the table for this to actually work, and that's that's keys in transition being spacing that we. We get that rebounder, we get scored upon, and our guys find width, and we run. We're not crowding up the middle of the floor. We're, we're pulling apart the defense with our transition spacing. We think of offensive spacing as only half court, but I would challenge anyone watching or listening to think of spacing being a transition offense quality as well. 
We find width in our first three steps. We drive out and then deep. We get width, then depth. So we pull apart the defense, and then when we do maybe get into a drag screen, the, the defense, we've got lanes and alleys, and the defense is stretched not only horizontally, but if we get all the way to the deep corners, they're stretched vertically as well. So, so you can kind of watch, like I'll watch, I watch a lot of teams and, you know, coaches I work with, games on television, NBA games, and like I'll see like, the first, the beginnings, the infant stages of, of we just gained back possession. And I'm like, ah, this possession's not going to be any good. They, they're, they're jumbled up. Their space they're, is bad. They're, and then I'll see one where you see the team like, okay, something good's about to happen here. You know, like you can kind of pick up on those qualities early. I, it's setting the table for success when we get down there into the half court. Um, the big – if they're a roller, we want, you know, we talked about popping. That could be personnel driven or, or um, you know, something you prefer over rolling. But if they are a roller, we want them to roll hard after setting the screen. Um, breaking the defense is, is like that roll is sometimes that roll, just a good roll, like a good well-timed slip out of a ball screen or a good roll out of a ball screen sometimes attracts people like uh oh that guy looks open i'm going to i'm going to suck in and take away that roll or we call that breaking the defense he broke the defense with the roll maybe he doesn't get the ball or she doesn't get the ball but we throw back now back outside you know and because we we really showed and rolled hard we we broke we collapsed the defense with that roll um you know this this is sort of like a personal preference uh, maybe this last sentence is like don't run don't run into the lane uh, don't, or what, you know, what most people call rim run. Like, you know, I call that rim, don't rim run unless you have a sure layup. Like, mm-hmm. like if, 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 if you're five out, if you're four out that, yeah, rim run, like we want to show up for round one anyway. So go ahead and do that. So I, I, I would say, you know, kind of like leave that to some players discretion. Like I don't want to be so uh, dogmatic that like we we're turning like if I hey coach I can just outrun my guy and go get a layup well go ahead and do that like go ahead mm-hmm. go ahead and do that like I can outrun this guy and he's he's not getting back on D so just sort of like use your judgment of when I can rim run or when it might serve me best to sort of throttle down stay even or lag behind the ball and ready to we didn't talk about anything about reversing to the big but let him reverse to me or let me drag screen or go to the ball. If, it, if they play a first side handoff or something like that mm-hmm. or 21. So we yeah, tell just our- that, we- that, that feel that we get of like, Oh, I'm going to go ahead. And if you do run ahead and you didn't get the, the, the ball, we already, we showed what to do there. Just comes, come back out and set that step up with that. I like that angle. I do like that angle. That's a tough angle for the defense to deal with when you're coming up and you sit more like a flat ball screen from underneath. Mm-hmm. When it comes to rim running, we tell our guys, if you're not in front of your man, then you, for us, it's it's the guards because we do rim run, we do four out. But mm-hmm. for our guards, what I found early was they were breaking at free throw line extended in towards the goal because they thought they had a free, they had a layup opportunity. But when you went back and watched the film, they're not in front of their man. They're even with their man. And I know that they feel like they're open, but if they don't get to the deep corners, then it ruins the rest of what's coming next. So we yeah. just simply tell them if you're not, in, if you're not completely in front of your man and like, to your point, you have a layup opportunity, then you need to be running to the right spot. Yeah. Pulling. We need, we need width and depth. Oh, for sure. Um, why don't you, I mentioned this at the beginning. Can you point people to any of the resources that you have either on your website oh, or man, there are a couple think. on the fast model site as well that have to do with early offense? Oh man, I need to think on where I did a clinic not too long ago on mm-hmm. early offense and five out and stuff like that. Um, if anyone has any questions, let's just do this. I can't remember where exactly I have that. Um, if anyone is interested in that, I'll just just DM me or email me or something, and I'll I'll get it to them. Sorry, uh, I, I I don't know if that's um, out there for the public. You know, it was just a one time clinic, um, but I'm happy to share the information. So anyone wants to see what see my take on early offense, they uh, just hit me up. I'll I'm. I'm not, I'm not trying to keep it secret. It's not mine anyway. It's Mike D'Antoni, my 
coaching idol. <laughs> there are also a couple on the Fast Model blog site. If you go to fastmodelsports.com yeah. and click on the blog from the drop down link, you can search Randy or Radius Athletics. And there are a couple that are not this broad, but there are some like specific quick hitters that he has in a couple of the, those posts. So you can check those Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you turn on any NBA game, um, even college basketball, I'm noticing you're probably going to see some sort of variation to five out, at least at some point during the course of a game, whether it's just the team's natural offense or even like a, a quick hitter or something that they run. Um, it's something that's talked quite a bit about and we've discussed quite a bit about here yeah. on this show. Uh, Randy, where does this, what we're going to discuss today, where does that piece, where does this piece fit into um, that idea that we've said you transition from your offense where your transition offense into that half court offense and this the ability to kind of seamlessly move from one to the other to keep that consistent offense with pace and space. Yeah, I think I think what we're going to talk about today, the the dribble push um, is it fits within that in that it's a way to to uh, initiate your half court offense from the break that maybe is a little overlooked. I think, I think when I see a lot of the five out offenses, if you think about the offense coming into the front court, the thing they do first is either maybe drag ball screen or double drag ball screen, or they pass ahead to the wing and cut or, or they dribble handoff with the player below them, or they reverse to their trail player in the middle of the court and play off that pass to the second side or back to the first side. Um, I, I kind of picked this out to highlight and go a little bit deeper on because I, I think it might be kind of one of the least common ways to initiate five out um, from from the break. And it's a little overlooked. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd give it some love by going a little bit deeper into this topic. I would say it fits into the greater five out thing in that it can it can be a way to change your shape. Um, where, where you maybe show up in a traditional five out where you've got floor balance, you know, your, your corners are filled on either side, your wings are filled, your top of the circle is filled or, or, uh, you know, in this, by using a dribble push, we sort of remain five out, but shift our shape. And, and instead of the, the, you know, ball screen coverage that a, a defense might get used to say, defending a basic traditional drag all the time. They got to defend a side drag or a wing ball screen, um, possibly right off right off the break in transition. So you just shape shift. You you do a little bit of, of of maneuvering of the defense by using the dribble push. That's maybe overlooked with some of the more common uh, five out initiators. Randy had all last summer. Last summer was his summer of, of five out, and yeah. I think a lot that a lot of people that do follow us and in particular follow you started down that path of just looking at five out offense. But now when you're entering season two for a lot of coaches or season three, you want to get a little bit more specific on some of the things that you're teaching your teams. And so I think this is a great um, kind of deep dive into what are some additional things that maybe other teams now know that you're a five out team and yeah. they're scouting you to those basic actions. What are some of those little uh, adjustments or tweaks that we can make to our offense? So let me go ahead and put this up on the screen here. And Randy, you can start with just the general alignment that we can dig into some of the specifics. Yeah. So what you see in that diagram is sort of like the traditional transition lanes that you would see as a team moves into the front court. And like I mentioned, a lot of times two would just continue on to that right corner. Three would hit the left corner and we would show up in that symmetrical sort of five out positioning. Um and drag ball screen or, or whatever it is that we're, we're, we're going to do. But um, in this, um, in the, using the dribble push, we're going to shape shift a little bit. So, so uh, player one just dribbles at two. And instead of coming over the top or a handoff or something like that, they just move to the other side. They push through to the other side. Um, you can signal that. Um, I've seen it signaled by like a point guard sort of like pushing with their hand or making some sort of pushing motion or just a little, simple wave through like telling the guy like going through you know um so but but yeah so what we do is just sort of move and we can then play two side with you know play with a two-man side over here and then three-man side over there like uh you know great great timing on switching the diagrams there because as after we've pushed two through 
One, we want them to get to free throw line depth or lower. If I don't have it drawn quite that low, but like if we can get to free throw line depth or even lower, that's great. Um, and then and then bring the dribble back and my trail man can kind of move over in and we can get right into a side drag or a wing ball screen. So you're still getting into your first action within the first, you know, four to six seconds of, of gaining possession. But instead of the traditional drags or double drags or things like that, we're, we're shape shifting a little bit and moving the moving the uh, action to the side. I believe uh, the Bucks do this. I was just watching last night the Bucks and the Celtics playing. I know they do a lot of five out, but it kind of puts yeah. your immediate um, pressure on the ball screen defense. And for them, somebody like Robin Lopez, who can either shoot it or you know drive, and you got the two man game on that side. And I also noticed it triggers a lot of stuff after that as well, because then that puts pressure on help defense, which then allows you to yeah. throw it to the opposite side and then the dominoes fall. And uh, so right from the very start, creating that advantage that, to get the dominoes flown in the half court. And that leads to the, the next one there that we talked to that you mentioned. But what you what can you do with that five guy after that? Well, they can pop or roll, and and you know what? And if it was traditional drag in that right corner where where I have the pink box sort of highlighted, um, if that was filled, if we set a, a traditional drag or a spread ball screen look, we've got a we got a tag man, we've got a someone who can you know to 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 help help with our ball screen defense behind the action, if you will. But but by shape shifting with the, the dribble push, we've we've removed that. So so um, we've got. Um, We've got the option to pop to that space or roll to the basket um, on the on the pop. You know that that could be dependent on that player's ability to to make that shot or shoot that um, on the roll. Um, one thing I like to use on the side ball screen is sort of like what we call our rolling target. Like what what's our screening angle and our rolling target? And our rolling target on a side ball screen is corner of the backboard. So. So like if we if we dribble push we wave a guy through we we get we flow right into spread ball or I'm sorry side drag or, or, or wing ball screen we come off the ball screen the roller is sort of like showing their hand to the corner of the backboard the 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 ball hand and we just sort of throw it up to the corner of the backboard um, one thing I didn't talk about in this uh, this presentation that's possible would be if two two could also short that instead of going all the way to the long corner, they could stop in the dunker. So that way, if maybe that player is not a person that you want, you know, to be spacing all the way to the deep corner, they they're they're, they're not a shooter or something like that. You can stop them in that short corner, that dunker spot area, and we can wing ball screen, see if we can shorten that roll up a little bit, hit the roller, get X two to help, and then play to them in the dunker. But um, so. Well, there's lots of uh, of options off the side ball screen. The the and one I didn't mention, the most obvious would be just one using it and, and getting into the lane and scoring themselves, or perhaps collapsing the defense on what would be the three side over there and and playing 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 to that off the penetration. I like it because it just immediately gives you so many. Op it gives you three options right away, or as I just mentioned, it triggers the start of those dominoes falling and right. Can end up with a wing three point attempt if you make just two three passes in three or less seconds in the first uh, bit of the shot clock there. Yeah. And the next one here. Yeah, and and, and one thing that that um, I, in in the ball screen teaching that I've done and 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 try to encourage coaches is we we say reject every chance you get, reject every chance you get, and when we've we've dribble pushed. We've set up a wing ball screen. We've got an empty corner, so there's no one to to stunt and help on that on, on that right hand drive that you see from player one in that second frame. There, uh, we we've got a, a a a prime opportunity to reject if 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 the defense is is susceptible to that. So, um, and then another thing too is after I've pushed two through, I dribble push them through. And, and my ball screen arrives, maybe I, 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 I slow down to see if I'm going to use the ball screen, and then I reject with, with an aggressive baseline drive. I've got player two in the headlights of the drive. If their player is the one tasked with helping, um, then, then I can play it to the headlights and, 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 and create a corner three off the drift pass. What I don't have drawn would be five could slide into my taillights on that baseline penetration. So if I'm stopped by X2, I can stride stop pivot back and find find my teammate player five in my taillights and and um 
and all from the reject. So, so anytime I, 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 I would examine a wing ball screen, like say a popular offense, a Euro continuity ball screen or something like reject, reject, reject every chance you get to put that deep, put the pressure on the rim and that lowest help defender to have to stop a drive. And then that can create the, the domino effect that you're speaking of. Yeah, I like that one. All right. Next one here. Just simply follow the leader drive. Yeah, so we've pushed two out, and maybe like right about the timeline, we make like a little hezzy or a, uh, a a change of speed move, and we and we we simply follow the leader. Two being the leader, he's he or she is cleared out, and now I've got that empty side to attack. And and um, you know if you've got a strong right hand driver, and that's perfect situation to follow the leader. A lot of times, what I've seen is if two will make a hard cut. And, and, and push on out of there quickly. Sometimes X2, whom I don't have drawn, like I will, will puppy dog their man and just follow them out of the lane. Now, you know, I wouldn't count on that against good, well coached defenses. Most, most defenders are, are, are coached to stop at the midline or something like that in that situation. But, you know, sometimes players don't do what they're coached to do all the time and they, they, they trot on out of the lane with their man and we're able to follow the leader. Um, for a layup, I would advise sort of like maybe like a some sort of change of speed, change of direction, move to sort of set that up, and 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 that 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 gives time for uh, player two to exit on out of the lane, um, and and we have a clear path to the to the rim with that empty corner cleared out now. I'll tell you when this does work a lot. I had success this year when we needed a quick bucket at like the end of a game or end of a half or something like that, because to your point. In those scenarios, usually X2 will stick with two because they don't want to give up a three-point shot. And so you give that yeah. little hesitation, whatever, and there's usually nobody there to yeah. guard the basket and get you a quick bucket within the first five seconds. Yeah, and same as rejecting the ball screen, I would want I would want player five or the or the next man over from from the driver, whomever that is in this diagram, it's player five to when we've got, we always want a player in the headlights and a player in the taillights. So two is naturally moving to the headlights. So the next man over would, 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 you know, move into the taillights in case X2 does, you know, wall up, stop the drive. I can stride, stop, get on two feet. I can either play it forward, play it to a 45 or, you know, reverse pivot on my back foot, donut, if you will, back to the player behind me. A lot of times drive it. And if it gets cut off, turn around and Barkley out of it. Yep, exactly. Um, the fill from behind, or we even go and like set that like crackback screen, like five for the next guy over, whoever that is. Yep, that's a good idea too. Shots off of that as well. So that may not look very impressive, but you can actually do a lot of things out of that. And at different times of the games, can serve different purposes, as simple as it may look there. Yep, that's good. So um, in the dribble push, we've talked about you know, the option of, of following the leader on the drive, what we just talked about, what we talked about primarily was, was dribble pushing to the wing, the trail following and setting a wing ball screen that we either accept or reject or roll or pop with the, with the screener. But we can also dribble push and, and, and the trail remains centered and play to the trail by centering the ball. Like you have um, drawn here, centering the centering the pass back to the trailer and then playing off that options, off those options. So uh, what I don't have drawn and included in today's presentation would be for five to catch that centering pass and play to the second side, which there's a myriad of options there that we could, you know, someday get into. Uh, but but um, what I do have drawn in the next frame would be would be some of the advancements from that. So instead uh, I, instead of two exiting all the way to the far corner they see that reversal that centering pass and they come up the gut and um and that's a you know a good good term for this action that i've seen is gut by, by player two who was dribble pushed out instead of exiting the lane and going to the far corner when that when the five man has the ball at the top of circle they just come up the gut take a handoff um we could we could tight curl that handoff maybe into a drive just right on the other side of it but if two goes under x2 goes say on the other side of that handoff we could just turn and spread ball screen and you know one find that corner depth and we've 
we dribble, push, come up the gut, hand off, turn, spread ball screen, all within the first third of the shot clock or the first the, the early phase of possession. Um, and this is this is a, a an interesting cut that that's that's interesting um you know you don't see it a whole whole lot of the player coming up the gut like this so um hopefully that may be something creative or new or something that you haven't really uh okay that's a good way to apply that um of that coming up the gut like that i've seen mostly just nba teams do that and i think the thought is my players you don't get a great shot because you're like fading you're going away from the basket but most don't use it as a shot they use to your point is like turn around ball screen or just catch it and kind of loop it. Now you got like that double triple gap on that side where you can either make the defense come off the corner shooter. Cause there's not really much help there or uh, just go and score it there. Yeah. And I've also seen teams flow into some elbow action off of this gut uh-huh. where, where two comes up the gut five takes a dribble or two, like I have drawn there, they hand it off and then they sort of find some post positioning type, you know, arm bar a guy and show a hand and then and then we pl- two gets the handoff and then immediately plays back to five at the elbow and and almost like point screen away or over the top to one in the corner uh screens for one in the corner so you can go push to gut to elbow splits or something like that so uh, yeah yeah interesting next one here using the after the ball centered yeah dribble handoff on that empty side Sim- simple. So, so we've dribble pushed. One is dribble pushed. Two, two is kind of exiting through the lane. As I have it drawn in that second frame, they're on their way out of the lane. Five, who we centered to, just immediately puts it back on the floor. One throws it, tries to outrun their pass, and gets it right back off the handoff, and maybe get get downhill penetration. So, sort of like the 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 wing ball screen. I would, you know, five dribble at one, dribble at his defender more specifically. One, come over the top, take the handoff, five, roll to the basket out of that handoff, and we've sort of kind of done um, a, a a wing action, a side action, similar to just going right into side drag. Yeah, great way to – And it's bang, bang. It's, 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 it's dribble push, throw, dribble at, handoff, like, like all that flow and connectivity is hard to guard, even though they're simple yeah. just passes and exchanges of the ball. It makes the old come set a ball screen. The defense knows it's coming. Let's get into our ball screen coverage. When you have bang, 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 they're not really able to set up and call that out. And there's like yeah. a hesitation and I feel like you find more advantages when that happens. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So let me ask this because we do have a lot of people that, that um, run four out. And I know some are like tinkering with five out. If they're looking to either make the switch or just incorporate it a little more, Mm-hmm. Is this something where you feel like your five is the determining factor of whether or not you can really do this well? Uh, the, like their skill set or their yeah. their ability? Um, possibly. I, I mean, for for most, I would say, yeah. But but you know, I think the thing that that maybe get, gives pause to some coaches is my five man is just you know can't shoot from out there so why would they be out there well I'm, I'm i watch a lot of basketball and see jared allen at the top of the circle or rudy gobert up there. i mean they they don't shoot from there because they can't but they're still able to be advantage creators ball screeners handoff deliverers things like that so i think just open your mind a little bit to from from don't you're like you you can be somewhere on the court possibly where it where you can't shoot from and it still be okay. Um, I do think though that there there might be um, some some trepidation around the bigs because they are often a trigger man in a lot of these actions. So if that's a role that they've not been accustomed to, that can be a hurdle for for making that 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 decision. So so. If, you know, a lot of times when you see that big at the top of the circle in five out, they're, they're, they're a trigger man. Maybe we reverse to them and they've got to deliver a zoom on the second side or a handoff on the second side. And, and maybe some coaches look at that as being beyond their players' current capabilities. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's probably one consideration that, that, that is factored into a decision to make a move from four to five out would be, 
how comfortable am I with my fifth player, if you will, out there sort of triggering actions or being a, even something simple as I catch it from this guy, I reverse it to that guy, like seemingly simple. But I think a lot of coaches have maybe like a cringe worthy player that they feel like that, that, that would be asked of them. And, and that's enough to, to give them enough fear and pause. But as I always say, um, do some of that coaching, you know, if, if, if you have a player, their current skills don't make you feel great about that. Well, change those skills, improve those skills, improve that comfort level. This is why we practice. This is why we convene every day for 90 minutes to, to grow as players and expand our abilities. So if you have a growth mindset of like my player's current ability, that scares me a little bit, but we don't play today. It's April 8th. Right. So maybe by September 8th or October 8th or November 8th, we've gotten to a point where, okay, I, I think he can do this now or she's capable of this now. Randy, in my opinion, mm -hmm. the advantages of a ball screen offense, uh, the easiest is creating an advantage for the ball handler, but there's a lot more to it. What are some of the advantages, in your opinion, of running ball screen offense? Well, I think I think what um, the main advantage is, I, I, I really, you know, you, you watch NBA basketball, EuroLeague, college, whatever, I, I don't see anything – that's that's as immediately effective as a ball screen for sort of like creating a little bit of disorganization in in a defense you know if you get you get two on the ball you get a third guy has to take the roller you get you kind of just get the ball rolling you get that advantage created really simply straightforward out of a ball screen in my opinion better than any anything else um, that, you know, isn't just one guy breaking someone down with a dribble. So as far as an action goes, I think it's just like the quickest, simplest, easiest way to create some disorganization in the defense. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about uh, ball screen offense and also mm -hmm. ball screen defense, but really breaking it down and not just for the two people that are on the basketball, but also for um, – you know, things off the ball. And we'll show some of those in just a few moments. We do want to start at the beginning, though, which, as we've talked probably three or four episodes on, how can I transition this from my transition offense seamlessly into half court so that for a team that and a lot of coaches that listen to us are running something with pace mm -hmm. um, and obviously the space that we've discussed as being so important, how can how can something like this spread ball screen seamlessly transition into our half court offense yeah great question i think i think um kind of some ways i've done that as a coach would be to leave to leave main street the 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 connection of the lane lines that would run right in the middle of the court to leave that reserved for the big like here you see scola here in 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 the photo so as you're transitioning that that that's that middle lane of the court, what I call main street, that belongs to our big stay out of it. Do you other guys find a sideline? Like you see, like maybe you see two guys commonly running to the deep corners on, on either side, a third guy, like kind of trailing one of those guys to form that double side. Like you see on our left up top in this, in this screen screenshot, the ball can come up either side in either alley. Um, and, and Main Street belongs to the big. So if you'll transition that way, you're just sort of naturally set up for your, your big that's, that's transitioning in Main Street to find the ball either to his or her right or left and, and drag screen for it and transition. So within a few seconds of gaining possession, as you move, you create width and depth with your, the three players outside of the ball screen. Your big and whoever's advancing the ball get right into a ball screen off the break without having to call it, set it up, you know, signal, head tap, chin, or anything like that. Just go right into it. And then what are some of the things that can immediately either hamper or kind of kill your ball screen offense in regards to spacing? In regards to spacing, I think what I see too often is is the, the, the guys outside – the the uh the ball screen so if you let's let's break it down like this a ball screen is a two-player action duh it's two ball, ball handler and screener that leaves three players outside of the action 
And if they don't find width and depth, um, then it, it kind of makes, makes um, you know, kind of makes creating an advantage, rolling to the basket, getting downhill, all that more challenging because we didn't find width and depth. Here's an example you have on the screen. I think this is, this is an old screenshot from the 2016 Olympics. So, uh, but um, this is Argentina in the white and blue uniforms. Uh, yeah, what I don't like here is like that wing, instead of being down at rim depth in the corner, he's up. So if the ball handler is, you know, if, if we did our job, we set a good solid screen, we're kind of drive past the big, well, I'm kind of clogging that space by not being all the way down into that deep corner. Um, I'm, 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 I'm almost in effect guarding my own teammate by pulling my defender up, up off of the uh, baseline into that space that he's trying to attack. So I think the biggest thing is, is those guys outside the ball screen, find width, find depth. Let's, let's get maximum space away from the ball screen. So if we do break the defense with a drive or a roll, like whoever's got to come in and collapse has to go a long way and they have to go a long way back. So, yeah, here's an improvement from Argentina where um, the the there's much greater, almost the same situation, but now you can see that the the wing is is more at rim depth. So when the guy does get downhill off the ball screen, he's got more space to attack the ball hand. I think too. Uh, we'll get to this probably next week, but coaches will often ask me, you know, how do I improve my ball screen? offense and where do I have my players look mm -hmm. when they're coming off of that ball screen and most are looking in front of them to that guy in the corner but even in the bottom right hand corner that we see here I, I've mm -hmm. found that you're usually the most often the biggest advantage for a shooter at least is happening behind the action because if you teach your big guy to roll which will show a variation of that uh, mm -hmm. pop option as well but if he rolls hard then you have in this case number 29 is the guy that ends up on the backside with somebody with a really long closeout and if it's a help the helper situation then you can just one more down to the corner for a wide open shot my point is is that none of that happens if you start with frame number one yeah you're 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 just plugged up <laughs> you know and 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 the uh and the space and the uh, the the sort of the dilemma that you're hoping to put the defense in just isn't there if you're if you don't find width and depth. Yeah, yeah, and you're you you're even... spot on too. Like the guy behind the action, you know, is is often the beneficiary, right? Mm -hmm. I want people just to think because they 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 do frequently think it's just for the two people involved in the action. The guy setting the screen, the guy coming off the screen, and the other guys are well. If they if they get open for a wide open shot, but there's so much more that can the dominoes. There's so many more potential dominoes if you start with the right spacing and then move right off of that. I guess yeah, that's the, my main point. it's all the details, right? It's it's all the details go into the whole the whole thing, everything from screening angle to getting the on ball defender to go over. If that doesn't happen, then we don't get the domino of someone outside of the ball screen having to tag a roller or help on a drive. So all, all it's it's all it's simple but complex, right? So it's simple in just spacing and design and intricacy, but it's complex in that the details of it sort of need to go right in order for to get the uh, to get that advantage that we're hoping to gain from using this action. So let's do talk about the detail and Aside from the spacing, I would assume that the thing that kind of triggers everything else is just how the screen is set and the details of that. And it's a little bit more involved than mm -hmm. just running up and finding an offensive player or, excuse me, a defender guarding the guy with the ball and, and just setting a screen. Yeah. Um, these are some old screenshots. You can see this is another Olympic event or an international event of some kind. But uh, this is a... This is a classic. I mean, you, you watch an NBA game. Well, not tonight because they're on all-star break, but watch some from last night and you see this exact thing. Might be some false motion get to it. Might be drag and transition, but like this is offense 101. Um, and and um, the, the, the number one priority for me when I, when I coach this and talk about this, the number one pri priority is to get the on-ball defender to go over the screen. And you asked about screening angle. I kind of tried to have that drawn here. 
Um, I call it screening the back pocket of the on-ball defender. Imagine he was wearing, you know, some jeans or something that had a, a back pocket on, on it. That's what I'm aiming for when I'm the screener. So I'm micro adjusting my angle to get that back pocket that I can see as I approach the screen. So he has to go over it. Um, and here, you know, some other, I guess, vocabulary, if you will, you know, closest to us is the single side furthest from us is the double side, one player, single side, two player, double side. So it's important to kind of like when we're, when I have a conversation about ball screen and spread ball screen is, you know, which direction is the ball screen headed toward the single gap? I'm sort toward the single side or toward the double side or those things like that matter. But um, yeah, so the screening angle is important. And again, approaching it from the standpoint of what's our objective here? What are we actually wanting to happen? We want the defense to go over the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that that's how you coach your big to sit the screening angle, you know, like, if if you're just parallel to one of the sidelines and don't have like a slight angle catching that back pocket, it's almost like you're scooping the player. If you're parallel, it's like it's just too easy to slide under. You kind of got a little subtle angle to 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 make him want to go over it. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that even the D1 level, how it's apparent that this is not taught or it's rushed, and yeah. there's no advantage. And so it's almost like a waste of we just wasted two or three seconds running and pretending like we're setting a screen because after the screen was set, everything's neutral again. It's a great. So it's like, why did we even bother doing that? So I think just that, you know, that micro detail right there mm -hmm. can be the difference between you playing five on four versus completely neutral and you got to start all over working your way up. We talked about this last or the last time we were together, but like how a possession you're trying to almost like go downhill and it should be picking up with speed. But mm -hmm. then now you're trying to pick up speed again and work back up the hill because everything's neutral and now we don't have any kind of advantage. Yeah. I think, I think that's a big, a great point and a big part of why so many ball screens are ineffective is it's just, it's just, you know, kind of like slowing down at the point of attack and reading the defense and taking the time to get sit sit your man up. You know, you watch Chris Paul play; he's a master at it. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll he'll get the get to get the dribble where he wants it to get Aiton or whoever's coming out to get you know right where he wants him. And 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 yeah, you got a twenty four second shot clock, but you play slow so that when the action actually transpires, bam! We now we play fast and and we, we react to our decision fast and we. And because the screen was actually effective instead of just playing fast and really seeing nothing. Yeah. yeah, sure. All right. So we alluded to this, but I think the common misconception is it's basically involving the four people in the action, the two offensive player and the two defensive player. And the other guys just kind of hang out until maybe something's something's created for them. Mm -hmm. Talk about those those three amigos and then also some of the potential things that you can do to make your spread ball screen offense a little bit more difficult to guard for the defense. Great. Yeah. Three amigos, little nickname for the three players outside of the outside of the ball screen. And I do think, you know, you just touched on it a moment ago when you said like at the lower levels of play college, high school, it really is kind of a two man action because we don't have the skill to be calm and see and assess. So we're just boom, right off the ball screen. Right. And, and really we don't see the coverage where you watch like Chris Paul, Luka Doncic, the people, you know, up, up the levels of play. It's more of a four, three, a three, four, even five player action mm -hmm. because this one little catalyst of the possession, the ball screen and then as I'm coming off of it, I'm assessing who's got the roller, where'd the tag come from, who's, you know, what, who stopped me from getting downhill. All those are questions that players are able to process to, to sort of now bring it into to the um, to a more of a three, four, five player action. So you asked about um, the three players outside the action. The first thing when I taught this was. Um, was we didn't really move much outside of the ball screen initially. We got three guys, like you see here, to, to get maximum space. On the double side, we call that holding the sideline. On the single side, same thing, rim depth, holding the sideline. I don't want you standing up on the three-point arc. We're trying to create maximum width and depth. So this ball screen in the middle third of the court, when he breaks the defense with the roll, 
Now we got now we've got some things to read. We've got defensive decisions that have to take place, and based on those, we kind of know what should happen. So, so the main thing I want the three guys outside of the ball screen looking at, I want them still while learning, <laughs> to so they so they can watch their man, watch your man, not the ball, not the ball screen. Watch the guy guarding you, and and look for any opportunity. Did my guy tag the roller? Did my guy help on the drive? Did is my guy the likely suspect to help on the on the downhill drive? Um, so, like you know, if this is a screenshot, but if this is a video, the screener, if he rolls out of that screen and sort of rolls down this lane line nearest to us, that would that would force that guy behind the ball screen, the defender, to tag him to take that roller. And that's what that guy in the single side corner is looking at. Like, watch your man. He'll tell you what to do. If he goes in to tag, I'm going to shake up out of the corner. And the ball handler, you know, we got to be on the same page like quarterback and receiver. So when he comes off that ball screen, who's got the roller? Who takes the roller? That'll tell you everything if you're the ball handler. Who takes the roller? Is it the guy back here? Is it the low guy on the double side? Like, all of those things we've got. It's like it's like a flow chart of questions that we're at. We're having to answer it like hyperspeed. And some things you can do outside of the ball screen is you can manipulate who's going to, you know, if you kind of know who's going to tag the roller, you can manipulate that or you can you can increase space. Like say in this screenshot, if this guy's coming to his left off the ball screen in toward that double side, well, that's not as much space that's on the single side. So we could we could twirl. We could, you know, the guy on the high wing could run to the corner on his side. The guy on the corner could run baseline and the guy on the single side lift up and we move more space in front of the attack. And now we put the, the guys who are having to do, tag roll, who's got, who's going to stop ball, who's going to help that we put them in motion and that becomes more complex task for them. Hmm. We could screen on the double side, like flare screen and run the guy on the high wing to the corner, the guy from the, in the deep corner, the double side, screen this guy who's standing here on the elbow and and as the guy coming off the ball screen just throw him open to the corner off the flare screen things like that but yeah. while learning what i wanted was our players the first thing i want the three amigos to learn is get width get depth watch your defender to see what opportunities their defensive coverage might present for you and it might just be hey i just he he tags in or he helps in to stop the roll and I just catch and shoot, right? That's that's mm -hmm. that's what I want them to train their eyes on their defender and how they respond to the action. Yeah. Man, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, look even at the top right hand corner there, probably telling that guy to go burn cut because his man's staring right at the basketball. I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. how the play ended, but um yeah, that's a great teaching point. Yeah. We'll come back to we'll come back to this. Uh, most likely next week to talk a little bit more and to show you some clips that go along okay. with that. We'll try to try to throw in a few of those. Let's talk here though. Just that we kind of want to give them a little bit of a, of a tease to what we're going to be talking about next week and some of the mm -hmm. things that you can do out of it. And to your point, um, you know, what can the guy with the ball do as far as reading his defender? As we just mentioned, what can the guys off the ball do when it comes to reading their defender just this week though, we're going to talk about the twist. Yeah, this is one that, you know, watch started watching a lot of European basketball five or six years ago. And, and I started seeing it's almost like an automatic. Anytime we set the spread ball screen and the on ball defender goes under the screen, which you're going to see here, it's going to play on a loop. So you'll see it as I'm talking over and over again, watch the guy guarding the ball handler. He goes under. I started to see, this is commonplace now, but five or six years ago, I was really only seeing it as an automatic in European. And now it's, pretty it's commonplace in the nba if you know again what i said a moment ago what's our number one objective i want the on ball defender to go over the screen did they no so let's rescreen it just think of it like this if 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 the mission is to create an advantage for the ball handler and the guy goes under and just meets me on the other side did we accomplish that no so rescreen it's like if at first you don't succeed, try again, right? Like, like you didn't, you didn't get him. He went under it. Now let's, now let's get it, give a second attempt, catch the back pocket on the other side. And now we'll induce that over. And you, what you see here is it goes under patience, patience brings it back. We get the back pocket. Now we get the over and we're coming back toward the single side where there's more space. 
Um, what I don't like here is the guy in the corner just, you know, he kind of is moving around. He wants to cut and he, and he almost like sabotages the action by not just holding, but he's anticipating having to shake up, but he sees the rescreen and he wants, you know, wants to get back, but doesn't set, it doesn't end up sabotaging the shot opportunity, but yeah. Um, the twist would just be like something you could teach your bigs and the guards as a as a way to make sure we create a downhill advantage is if automatic. They go under, I'm re-screening. You're big, they see it. I'm coming to approach the guy who's screening. He's either going to, you know, attach to the ball handler and try to beat o- beat, you know, beat me over it or he's going to drop and go under. As soon as I see that, I'm saying twist 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 and I I talk it and tell it to the ball handler so he'll slow down like he goes behind the back, but it could be a crossover and bring it back to the other side and re-screen it. I do like even the guy that almost sabotaged the play. At least he had the wherewithal to pull behind the action on the shake. Yep, absolutely. And then as the ball came back to him, he did push away from it. He didn't really yeah, know he, exactly he where to go. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he didn't ruin it to your point. I think, too, this puts a lot of pressure on teams now that are dropping in their ball screen coverage because the big can usually drop the first time and kind of close off the lane. But as you saw just in the clip there, they're mm-hmm. usually not fast enough to get back to the other side and plug the lane again. And so that's when you usually end up with a two on one and opportunity to score like he just did. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. And this is this is a simple if then thing that I really think even players at lower levels can learn. Like it, mm-hmm. if if I'm the screener, if then does the. If the ball handler's defender drops and goes under, then I'm re-screening. <laughs> if he stays attached and tries to kind of beat me over the top, mission accomplished. Cool. I'm going to just roll and we get the downhill penetration, right? Yeah. So without giving away exactly everything that we're going to do next week, what are some of the, th- the main actions or things that you can do and don't like I said, don't feel like you need to explain them all. But where would where would be what would be the next progression then of reads in the ball screen offense? The next progression of reads would be um, less 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 get great at throwing behind it when when we you know when we start to unpack who tags our roller, whether that's um, behind or in front of the action. Um, next progressions too would be let's run it at speed and transition. The third thing I think would be a good progression for our conversation would be how do we disguise it? You know, maybe we start a possession with a dead ball. We, 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 you know, our main tenet of our offense is spread ball screen, but, you know, we want to kind of hide it behind a little movement or a little, um, you know, some false motion or false action that all of a sudden, you know, looks like they're running something else, but then all of a sudden, boom, it just takes shape into spread ball screen. And we're doing the same thing, but it's not as straightforward. And and uh, I think that'd be a good discussion. So those three things is start to start to, um, you know, look at reading who's, you know, behind the action and, and the opportunities that generally presents. Let's run it in transition and then let's let's look at some entries into um, spread ball screen instead of just a simple drag or a simple walk it up and, and run out ball screen or something like that. Yeah, man, a ton of great teaching points. I'm going to go back and, and take some notes on that, yeah. especially as now we move into, I know some teams are already moving into the off, off season. And these are things that you can work on in a small group workout or with two guys in the gym. Uh, you know, you can jump in and, and teach them to read a, a ball screen mm-hmm. and just building that out from the ball. We talked about that from the defensive side, but just building those out and those those teaching points and, and really constructing your offense piece by piece um, and, and, you know, teaching guys where to go, where to look. I think um, the perception of everything is underrated when it comes to being able to teach and play as a player. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this can really help with that. So awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah. This is a continuation from the last episode that we had talking about spread ball screens. Mm -hmm. Uh, For those that maybe didn't hear about it last time or haven't listened to it or just need a refresher, Randy, let's go ahead and kind of start them off and kind of quickly go through what we talked about. Today, we're going to focus in, though, primarily on adjustments out of the spread ball screen. Yeah. So to review, we're just talking about just a high ball screen in the middle third of the court with the three players outside of that action, like you see on the screen, um, 
you know, on one side of the court, there's two players holding the sideline and, and um, on the other side of the ball screen, there's one. So we got a double side and a single side with a, with a high ball screen um, somewhere nearish the middle third of the court, just like you see on the screen there. And uh, yeah, there's another look, you know, just, you know, I think that one I'm, I'm trying to highlight the screening angle where the, 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 the player sit in the screen near the top of the circle there. It's kind of like catching the back pocket of the on-ball defender to try to force him to go over and, and allow us to hopefully get some downhill penetration into, into that space you see circled and highlighted there. So yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. I think um, what we're going to hit on today is, is some advancements from there, but in this, this clip there, I'm sorry, this shot screenshot here, excuse me. Um, you know, we're another kind of, um, I guess, piece of vocabulary would be the three amigos. There's two players in the action, the two players sit in the high ball screen in, in the middle third of the court. Then there's three players out of the action. And, and those, those, uh, a little nickname from those from the famous comedy, the three amigos, those three players, what do they do and where are they standing outside of the action? I'll even say, those three slides that we just showed, even though we quickly went over that, go back and listen to that episode if you haven't. Just mm -hmm. teaching points, um, even dealing with this slide with the three amigos, what you do with those three players, it's more than just them standing, giving space. But, you know, whether it's lifting up from behind, we'll show today or some other things that you can do with them, that really yeah. kind of separates your spread ball screen from probably what a lot of people, if they don't know what it is, just coming up and setting a high ball screen. There's more to it that goes into that. So I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. I don't know if you have anything else other than that, Randy. Yeah, just as we sort of move up in in understanding of, of ball screen play, the you know the three players outside of the screen can enhance the enhance the the uh, the action by by where they stand if if they move or not um, being able to react to to which which defender kind of helps out with tagging the roller or stopping penetration things like that so um, that that would be kind of as we move up through understanding but yeah that, that we're going to look at some things today that are uh, that will that will um, sort of touch on that. Yeah. All right, so let's get into those. We've got three actions for you to use out of your spread ball screens, and this first one here is the back action. Yeah, you know, you hear that I call it back action. I can kind of tell how old somebody is by what <laughs> word they use for some action in basketball. Um, you know, this commonly gets called like single side bump or a shake. Um, that, but people my age and older maybe call this back action the the so let's define it the the basically what we're looking at is we got the three amigos spread outside the ball screen like you see in frame one with a double side to our left a single side to our right uh, we've got the ball screen and and let's say it it's sort of accomplished its its aim which is to get to get two on the ball or or to to create some sort of advantage we're now a third defender a player outside of the ball screen who's not one of the two defenders in the action is sort of now called upon to help prevent the, the offense from scoring. Here you see the player behind the action. That would be two in the, in the corner with X2 defending them. Um, you know, a lot of coaches want that player to tag the roller, like to prevent the roller from rolling to the basket for a layup. So they've, in a sense, borrowed a player outside of the action to help neutralize or stop this two-player action. So we can exploit that. And to me, this is like a definition of what a good concept is in, in, in basketball. Is, is I, I coach defense. You do, and, and all, every, all of us do. And this is exactly what I'm coaching you to do. Like we need you to, you know, the two guys in the action to, hedge switch whatever and you got you behind the action i need you to tag the roller then get back your the the team is doing exactly what they're coached to do we're not depending on a defensive mistake we're exploiting their strategy to create an opportunity for our ourselves um so two is in that corner holding that corner reading that watching their man does he or she tag the roller if they do i'm going to shake up or lift up out of that corner behind the action and for the ball handler, player one in frame one, I always coach it like this. If 
if you're the ball handler, you're the trigger man in the ball screen, watch the roller and who, and that'll tell you what to do. Watch the roller. When they roll and they tag, that tells me to throw it back to the player lifting behind the action. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hopefully they just, that's a catch and shoot off that, um, you know, and the, the plays over the, the possessions over, um, um, they can also stampede that in right into a, a drive, like, like kind of just cut out of that corner, catch that, that throwback pass and just take it right into a drive. Um, but in the next couple of frames, like it's sort of like a common NBA or Euro league or something sequence that I see a lot would be if we throw to the back action there in frame two, they don't catch and shoot. But um, four, who's rolling, their man is on the inside, medial to the middle of them. Then the ball goes over their head. They leg whip them, and now we've got a post up, and we throw it right into the post for maybe a post move. And then uh, the, the the post feeder, player two, get right into a, a, a post split action with, um, with, with player one or whomever is at the top of the circle area. So there you see like a, a post split, and the screener slips, the cutter, uh, you know, cuts to the wing and maybe we, we can score off that action. So, so yeah, that's a common back action sequence. I think what you have queued up is, is maybe an example of Tyler hero um, from his time at Kentucky, um, you know, demonstrating this. So you see right here's the ball screen um, on the top of the screen. Yeah. Highlighted there's hero. He's the player behind the action, the back behind it. So Tennessee tags the, the roller. He lifts out of the corner and um, and easy shot for him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Rick Barnes is coaching. You got to tag the roller. So, um, so um, you know, that that's a way to exploit a team strategy. You're not depending on a mistake. You're doing you're doing something that the the affordance of that decision by them is is a shot for you if you read it right. So he shakes up out of the corner behind the ball handler like he he identifies the roller is being tagged and he immediately goes to the throwback and that's a layup for Hero. I see at the college and the NBA level like this is almost like an automatic but teaching coaching at a lower college level this is something that I had to teach our players. They just most ball handlers, when they come off the ball screen, all they see is what's in front of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and even after teaching it, so many of them would still come off the ball screen and then throw it in front of them. Yeah. But I think for many of us who teach out of concepts and we're trying to find that open man to create those dominoes, then this just makes sense. Yeah. And I think while it makes sense to us as coaches, having taught even this year, taught this action. Mm -hmm. make sure that your players understand what you're trying to accomplish. And I think if you already teach the concepts of finding the open man and then letting the dominoes fall, they'll get it, but it will take some drilling. And to your point, we have gotten not just shots off of it from behind, but then as the defense recovers and tries to get back to their original man, we get a ton of stuff off of the last slide that you showed, which was the last frame that you showed, which was throwing it into the post and then that split action getting a shot off of that because again you're screening and bringing two to the off the ball which ends mm -hmm. up kind of causing some confusion for defenders and you end up with a wide open jump shot or a slip to the front of the rim for a score so this is yeah. again I, I know it's a common action for modern day nba and a lot of high college and you see it a lot but mm -hmm. i think it at the it hasn't yet trickled down to the high school levels the way right. that probably some of the other actions are yeah so. we want to take ball screen offense from being sort of like a two player thing, the screener and the ball handler to making it a three, four, five player thing based on our vision and our understanding going from narrow to, to wide, like in, in, you know, a chess coach would tell someone, see the whole board, not just the next move, see the whole board. So when we come off that screen, I'm, I've got to be able to identify the roller who tagged them who where should the ball go who helped where'd they come from and and all of those things helps sort of widen the scope of a simple thing like a high ball screen mm -hmm. that's a good one all right let's talk about the next one here the short roll yeah i included this one because a lot of times um you i, I get asked or i see aggressive aggressive sort of ball screen defenses especially sort of like at the you know college or high school level where 
um, a team is is really blitzing or trapping um, the ball screen and and what's the counter or the antidote to that um, and uh, one thing that that I've seen and and um, observed is that if we can make that one pass out of that aggressive hard trap or double team which is which is hard I mean the, the, it it's you've got two players on the ball you've got to do it quickly and you don't want to get get a deflection or you're giving up a pick six but but if we can make one one pass out of that trap into the the the, the screener sort of rolling into that pocket of space um, rather than long rolling all the way to the rim, they just sort of like come out of the screen and just sit down in that space behind that trap and um, and short roll it. If we can get the ball to them, which I understand is a big if, then we're playing 4v3, right? So we've got an advantage. Um, so basically this is something to work on if through your scouting or through your um, you know preparation, you know that we're, we're going to, face a team that is aggressive in their ball screen defense they trap they hard hedge so the antidote to that is is a pocket pass or a hook pass into that short roller who's going to be kind of in that void right around the free throw line key area depending on where the ball screen is set we can deliver them the pass and they can face up they can attack or or um you know pass to where the help came from and and we can get it we're playing with an advantage then and that's, as you see, as we go through these four frames, there's the trap in frame two of the ball screen. Five sort of short rolls and sits down in the middle-ish area, like find that pocket of space. We, we somehow deliver them a pass, whether it's a hook pass, a pocket pass, a wrap around, somehow get them the ball. And then X4 helps, sees that as a threat, helps toward the, the, the nail, and we pass to where the help came from, and we're, came from and we're playing 2v1 and we get a layup. So I think we've got some videos of of Michigan um, from the NCAA tournament a couple years ago. They're playing a team. You see the aggressive, really aggressive trap there from, from their opponent when, when he comes out and sets the ball screen. Bam, there's a hard trap. He delivers a pocket pass. Now it's 4v3, and he just sort of finds the open player, cutter, whatever, you know. Um, so so the, the, the action accomplished its aim. We have an advantage. We just got to find it. And it's tough to do with two on the ball, but we, we've got to find it. And then that player becomes the trigger man to play from. So there's your two on the ball. You see him short rolling. and just almost looks like a high post in a zone offense. I'm just sitting in that void. And then, then we pass to where the help comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, this, is, this is the antidote, if you will. There's a hook pass. Pass to where the help come from. Dunk, right? Um in, in a sense, it becomes zone offense. Anytime there's two players on the ball, it's zone defense. Like the other three players are zoned up, right? So so uh, now we're playing 4v3, pass to where the help comes from. Easy. So, well, simple. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah. great. We played a, we played a uh, team here at the end of the year. I had to play mm-hmm. him at the end of the year and then had to turn around, played him twice, and then had yeah. to turn around and play him in the first round of the regional tournament. And they were the only team that blitzed uh, ball screens. But I, your frame number one there, I think a key teaching point: come off the ball screen. Don't pick up your dribble. Yeah, create that. You have it in the black there. But like one bounce back dribble to kind of create space from that double team. Maybe yeah, a, sort of a, drag that trap yeah. out. Yeah. Maybe even a second one so that you can open up and kind of have vision. And by that time, you've even brought the defenders out another two steps. Yeah. And that's where you throw either that hook pass or, you know, fake high and throw that pocket pass. And then now you have, like you said, that five in the middle that can either at our level, they weren't very great at rotating. So we had a couple where the guy just caught it in the middle and turned around and and scored. Yeah. By then, you know, a defender comes over and helps. Now you're kicking to a corner for a three point shot or on the dive like you just saw. So. Um, yeah. This is one of those I found that a lot of teams aren't aren't sticking with the blitz anymore, but they'll use it a like special situation. If you don't have if you haven't practiced this short roll and don't have it in your back pocket, you're going to get burned on it. So it may not yeah, be we, your go, the go to for the other team, but I would definitely make sure you're practicing it, especially late in the year. Yeah, you you need you need a solution for the possible coverages you might see, and when this one appears and you don't have a solution for it, your 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 ball handler feels really stranded out there getting double teamed and hedged on and, and, and we don't have a plan for them. Yep. Yep. Very good. 
All right, the final one here is an inverted dribble handoff. Yeah, this is something I picked up recently that you know I get asked sometimes, okay, I, I get it. I know what the double side is. I know what the single side is, and, and we're learning about this. So we drive, we get a little penetration, we kick, and but you know maybe we don't shoot. Like what, what next, right? Like what next? Well, I would answer that by saying, okay, Look at your shape or where your personnel when the when when that moment where you're thinking, okay, what next? Like, what do we look like then? Where what do we have? And and uh, you know, like here in this diagram, you see the spread ball screen. This time we're going into the double side. We kick to the low man in the corner. Hope if if X four who's not on the screen, but maybe they helped in. Maybe that is a catch and shoot, but maybe that's a non shooter for you. Somebody you know somebody who's who you don't want just launching threes and um so what what next one of the things that I, I i picked up on that i liked is to get right into this inverted dho i'm calling it inverted because like in your traditional dribble handoff the, the the deliverer is above the in relation to the baseline the recipient the recipients may be coming up out of the corner i'm dribbling off the top of the key toward them that that's traditional inverted the the deliverer player four here is below player three so um you know that that's an option that i kind of thought i would include today of like if, if we if we get that drive and kick we don't shoot it maybe they make a great closeout or i'm a non-shooter what what's a possible thing i can do next without the ball stopping and, and us having to, to sort of like restart our offense let's get right to something that the positioning and personnel affords us so i think you got a clip this is this is miami recently against the lakers i don't know how recent this is it's from the season but um it'll take a minute to actually get to the spread ball screen here it comes so you see pj tucker he goes right into the inverted handoff with hero again hero made it two appearances today but um but yeah so so there's the spread ball screen a little bit of penetration helping recover by the Lakers. And he, he knows it right. He knows it even before the ball hits his hand. He's like, I don't have time and space to shoot this. You can tell PJ Tucker is like, you can, if we, if we were able to slow-mo this, he's already dribbling up to hero with the ball still in the air. He knows that he's, he's going to go right into it. Um, and you know, that still yields a pretty tough shot that, that, that uh, yeah. but you know, that could easily be uh, turn the corner, drive the baseline, off that inverted handoff too. Yeah, I love that. The idea that the, a player, Rudy Gobert for the Jazz is like, you know, he's more thought of as a defensive player. And and I wanted to show like how he's, in addition to him being a terrific defensive player, has a pretty good grasp of of how to be a good screener in, in ball screen situations. So I think I set about the project with that motive in mind to show that like, you know, it's, yeah, he's a great shot blocker and, and and rim protector, obviously, but but he also has a pretty good grasp of of how to how to play that side of the ball in terms of being a good ball screener. And being a good ball screener is more than just using your body as a blocking dummy. There's like an understanding of angles and rescreening and and uh, adjusting the screen angle to to fit the coverage. So that that's kind of where we're going today with that with these video examples. For those of you that are watching, coaches that are running five out, you'll see some of the concepts that we've talked about before on this show, that maybe how you can uh, use them within a system that uses more ball screens or if you're looking to add more ball screens. And we'll talk about the transition aspect of it as well as the half court side of it. Um, let's go ahead and jump right into this, the first one here. Uh, we're going to start out kind of a little bit simple and then get a little bit more complex with it. Um, but the one that we have talked about before on this show before, just simply a middle ball screen. Randy, if you want to go ahead and start with this one. Yeah, so this would be an example of, of what I would call spread ball screen or middle ball screen where, um, you know, if we, if we were to get very elementary, um, we, would, we would want to talk about the ball screen being a two-player action. The, 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 in this diagram, player one and player five being the two players in the action, players two, three, and four being the players out of the action. So one point I'd like to make today would be um, that that the your job as an offensive coach is to not only coach the players in the actions, player one and five in this example, but also players two, three, and four. 
Um, so, um, yeah, in, in middle ball screen, what we want is is we I, I'll break it down really quick in transition. We want this to happen within the first four to five seconds of the ball screen. This 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 drag screen, the four, first four to five seconds of the shot clock, um, somewhere in the middle third ish area of the court. Um, and two and three all the way at rim depth in the corners, uh, four holding the sideline there with three. And, uh, you know, the purpose of using an action such as a ball screen is to create uh, penetration, which will lead to an advantage. So come down the court, we think spacing, action, advantage in that order. So there's, there's a, you know, a quick overview if you will yeah and this fr frame you just pulled up here in the bottom right corner maybe the floor is a little tilted to the right we didn't come down the ball came down the 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 court with no one in front of it so the the ball handler takes it a little bit deep and we get right into side ball screen same thing would apply we got a two player action players one and five in the action players two three and four out of the action so we want to know our spacing template our positioning whether we're wing ball screen, spread ball screen, um, where, for lack of a better word, our players outside of the ball screen stand. In the wing ball screen two and three, if I were drawing it, I'd move three over a little bit closer to the sideline. I like four spot. Um, so anytime we've got a double side on a ball screen, I like both, both players to what we call hold the sideline. That's an old Dan Tony term of holding the sidelines. We want to create maximum space for penetration i would think that probably most if they're looking at this the ideal is what's there on the left as everybody runs down the floor mm -hmm. but as most of us know it usually gets sloppy very quickly and you end up with two your two guards running down the same side of the floor Absolutely. and i've seen people get frustrated with that um, i've seen players try to adjust that so they'll have somebody run through and that kills the spacing and the timing and whatnot and so um, I guess my point is don't don't feel like this has to be perfect. Teach your players. We've done this with our guys this year, and it's helped a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't care how you run down the floor. Like, do your best, but obviously what happens on the other end a lot of times will dictate your lane and how you run down the floor for a transition offense. So if we don't have everything nice and neat, that's not the end of the world. Let's just keep mm -hmm. playing out of it. And right. You see there on the right-hand side is typically the alternative to the nice and pretty that you see there on the left-hand side. Yeah, one thing, too, I would say that I've begun to look at it is like, where's the ball screen in, in frame in the top left? It's middle and frame on the bottom right. It's it's side or, or wing, if you will. So, you know, kind of think in shapes, meaning if the ball screen's here, the three players outside of it, we want to be here, here and here. If the ball screen is here, like it is in the bottom left on the wing or the bottom right on the on the wing. We want to be here, here, and here, you know, uh, seam or slot, uh, wing and corner. And there's advantages to both of these. You know, the first Absolutely. one there, you get not diagrammed, but you get this kind of the lift or the shake action on the backside. Mm -hmm. But then in the bottom right, you get a clear side and no help defense. And so if you have somebody that you could throw the rim to, throw the ball to at the rim for the five on the roll or a pocket pass, uh, then you have nobody really on that side guarding it. So advantages room, to both of those. And room to reject in, on the bottom right too. If one doesn't right. want to use the ball screen, we've got an empty side. Where mm -hmm. and and if he did reject, player one did reject. He's got player two in his headlights. If he draws baseline help, and we could put the defense in a rotation that way. We have a lot of success. We'll reject it, and he'll turn around and set like that crackback screen. So five will go back and set the screen for four, and then four has the opportunity for an open jump shot. Five sets the screen and then rolls to the back side of the rim. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Absolutely. Something like that. Um, here's some video of, of each of those here. Okay. Yeah. So this will be the Utah Jazz, obviously, with Rudy Gobert. Um, the the spread ball screen in transition. You see that kind of good floor balance and shape and right into the spread ball screen. Um, where where the the screen let's, let's see if we can catch the shot clock 15 seconds that's a little slow i don't know where this this possession might have started with a dead ball or something i don't know but a little slow but the jazz aren't one of the more higher tempo teams either so could be right. that but um okay and here's the uh wing wing ball screen the second one 
Yeah, so you can already see Rudy in the trail position. There's nobody in the guy. I like The thing I like here is the ball handler takes it kind of deep. He gets down below the free throw line on the empty corner, uh, on that empty side. That gives him more room on the accept side of the screen. If he does choose to accept the screen for middle penetration off the ball screen, if, he, if he's up a little bit higher, um, you know, he takes it down below free throw line, uses change of direction, change of speed. We get a good, a good ball screen and uh, paint touch. But I think a good beginning point with players is like know your shapes. If the ball screen's here, we want to be here, here, and here. And and uh, you know, you can see that reflected in these videos. Yeah, that's cool. All right, let's go on to the next one here. Okay, uh, adjustment to ice defenses. So as as teams trying to keep the ball on one side of the floor here, what's an adjustment that the team can make in the ball screen? Well, I think what we're going to see in in this video. Um, is if my recollection is is clear is that there's going to be uh, a change of the angle of the screen where maybe gobert was was approaching the screen to set it like a regular like spread ball screen you know uh, with his with his with his butt more toward one of the sidelines but you know pay i always ask players what are you seeing and what are you hearing Right. So if it, when I'm approaching the ball screen, what am I seeing and what am I hearing from the opponent? So what am I seeing is their icing coach. What am I hearing? Maybe you hear the player X5 there saying, hey, ice, ice, ice or blue, blue, blue or down, down, down or whatever. So those they're telling you that, you know, like, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? So when you when you get those cues from your opponent, it's time to change the angle which is what you're, I think we're going to see Rudy Gobert do here. He's going to change that angle from more of what probably was going to be a spread ball screen to more of a flat ball screen, and that combats the ice coverage. So you see him approaching the screen, and then he changes the angle once he hears ice, 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 and, and flattens that ball screen and sits it on the hip of the icing defender, uh, the on-ball defender, and that leaves a little bit of a pocket for, for a pass to penetrate through. So you see Tristan Thompson dropped. He's yelling ice, 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 and they adjust the angle, and now we just, we've just we got a, a, a nice pocket to throw the pocket pass through. And these are typically just automatic things, right? This is not something you're calling. It's you're listening to hear it or looking to see it, and the guy should automatically adjust to it, right? I would say so, yeah. Like, I mean, it, it happens on the fly. Um, they're... they're it's, it's part of the knowledge that players need to possess to play ball screen offense, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like we've got to, we got to recognize coverages, recognize adjustments and, and counter. And that needs to be absorbed into our knowledge as a player. And, and I, I picked Gobert in this instance, because, you know, the, the knock on him is he's only a defensive player. He's not, and I was like, well, he's not a scorer, maybe not not necessarily a scorer, but he has value on the offensive side because he un, he gets these things that you at, are asking about. How, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? I heard ice. I'm going to flatten the screen out. Like, like that. That's part of the growth of a player too, and that's that's a, a good skill set also to be a good ball screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say it's part of it. Yeah. We used to be able to get away with just sending a guy out there, the biggest guy that we could find out there, mm -hmm. setting a screen, and then we just tell him just roll to the front of the rim, and that was effective at creating an advantage. But as these defenses be, the defenses have become, you know, smarter and, and faster, making the adjustments like ice and you know some other things too, switching and going yeah. under and that kind of stuff too. You have to you actually have to teach your big men to read and to listen, like you said, and to make the adjustments on the fly because it won't be that clean defense plays it the same way all the time yeah one teaching point that i do like for for bigs is 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 screening the back pocket of the on-ball defender that that can kind of help you it gives you a rule that that can maybe help you through some different adjustments so like in that video that clip you just showed when when gobert is approaching the screen the back pocket of of the on-ball defender is 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 sort of facing him then he hears ice 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 the on ball defender sort of jumps to the side and he screens the other back pocket by flattening his mm -hmm. his screen and in so like that's one maybe if, if, a, if there's a takeaway for viewers or listeners is is it 
if you're if you can get your ball screener to follow that commandment, if you will, then then you might make some of these adjustments naturally. Yeah, that's really good. This is one more of those adjustments. Let's talk about this. I just kind of explained it, but uh, going under and two scenarios here, one of them in transition and then the one in the bottom right could be in transition or within mm -hmm. your half court. Yeah, these are rescreens, right? So so what I started noticing a few years ago, probably five years ago or so, I, I watched, I went through like a, a, a really big phase of, of really where I was watching a lot of European FIBA, EuroLeague, uh, Champions League basketball. And one thing I saw across the board was this idea of rescreening when the on-ball defender goes under. And for the coaches I work with, who a lot of times coach high school basketball, uh, they're, they're going to see a lot of under, like the players going under all the actions, under off-ball screens, under on-ball screens, because few are the players who can just like maybe punish them by pulling up on the other side of the screen and shoot so they can go under the screen, meet you back at the ball, and stay intact on defense. So... Um, the under is uh, is something that we need a solution for as well. So when when the defense goes under, I, I call it twisting. We twist the screen and automatically rescreen. So I'm I'm coming. I'm approaching the ball screen. The guy's either going to sort of move up into the ball handler, which I know he's going to go over, or he's going to sort of move away and go under me if I'm the screener. In that case, I let him go under the ball screen or the ball handler sort of drags his man out and maybe a dribble or two and then crosses and brings it back. And we twist and rescreen and then try to get the back pocket on the second screen to get downhill penetration. I think that's what we're going to see here. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom right. Too, OK, yeah, we'll put these together here. Same. Yeah, we'll same put them idea. together. Gotcha. So the bottom right would be top. Top left is is twist. Bottom right would be turn. So five is down screening. One's bringing the ball. Five is going to go down screen away for two coming out of the corner. Again, what do we see? If he trailed, two would have curled. If he overplayed, two could have back cut. But in this case, he, go, he shoots the gap. He goes under the screen. So player two is going to maybe get the catch, but not have like going to step right into a shot or have an advantage on the catch. The, the guy goes under the screen, meets him at the ball, and there's no advantage. So Gobert, in this case, in these video clips, but but your screener should turn. I call this a turn. So there's twist in the top left, turn in the bottom right. Turn and immediately rescreen, and we get this sort of step-up style wing ball screen that's tough. And we'll see both of those. Yeah, where, where it's in... in it's an automatic. So there's the turn where there's a screen and a rescreen off the off ball screen. The, the cutter gets a catch, but, but is not really open on the catch so much. So, and he goes right into a rip and go right off that screen, the rescreen from go bear. So it's two actions, bang, bang, bang. One counters the other. You go under cool. You met him at the ball. You're going to immediately right into a, into a, uh, into a rescreen for, for, uh, for the for the cutter who came off the down screen a few more there and these are these again like you asked earlier these are automatic reactions we're not calling this we're teaching this on on monday wednesday and thursday so we use it on tuesday and friday it's not a call it's it's knowledge <laughs> it's it's application of good basketball principles um yeah, I like these kind of clips, too, because you even see what happens off the ball, you know, that push, pull or circle movement, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. But um, you see the adjustment of all five players. So this pick and roll is not <clears throat> just the, what, you know, the ball and the ball screener, but the guys off the ball here. You saw yeah. as when he came off the screen this way, everybody was pushing towards and then it flipped it, flipped it around, turned it around yeah, and the guys came get... behind it. And to your point, it creates an advantage for either the roll guy or you're going to have somebody open there on the backside because everybody's taught tag a guy that rolls or whatever. And so, you know, you you almost like double your playbook with the amount of things that you do. These concepts allow you to ba basically on the fly have multiple plays that you're running at the same time, which is why we've harped on this extensively and I've talked mm -hmm. about it. But, you know, playing out a concept is it's almost – more advent the guys that like to run plays i know you like to call plays but 
you almost get more plays running out of concepts because you can on the fly find the advantage and, and run a new play without having to call something and the defense sets up and the frustrations that defense advantage lost and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. And, and um, we're actually count countering what's happening on the court rather than call and hope, call and hope. Let's call right. this one and hope it works. Oh, it didn't work. Call another one. Hope it works. Call and hope. No way to go. No, no way. Yes. Bueno. That, that, yes, that's do that. a great way to that. describe it. Well, too, and you, for somebody, not everybody's like this. I know the high school coaches that watch this, a lot of you are not facing this yet, but you don't have a shot clock. So feel free to call and hope, call and hope, call and hope. But, you know, my teams have 22 seconds by the time we get in the half court. We got right. we got to make some plays on the fly here. Um, yeah, and that that's a, well put. That's the best argument for having some sort of shot clock mechanism is that you don't have time to kind of like, um, call and hope or just run it again or another reversal next, you know, you, so that's why I always argue the shot clock will make you a better teacher of the game because now you got to start teaching things like twist and turn. We don't have time to run another off ball screen and on the other side to see if we can get that one and then reverse it. And run. We've got to read it and combat it because tick tock. Right. So um, yeah. So those are those are good things to to try to simple reads adjustments uh, whatever you want to call them counters to to begin with um, the, the, another thought I would offer would be uh, if you look at at some of the data in the study like the ball screen itself for for the ball handler or the roller is often an in like those inefficient, those are sometimes inefficient shots. Like th those aren't really high ranking in terms of shot types in terms of, of, of points per shot. Those are kind of low ranking. So I think we think of using the ball screen itself, the two players in the action of like, how can my ball handler score or how can the roller score? But oftentimes the better mm -hmm. shot is we use the ball screen to get penetration or to get, get that pocket pass to the roller, and then the defense is collapsed and he kicks, or we get a drive off the screen, and now it looks like we're going to score, and one of one of the, the three defenders outside of the action is now called in to help, and they, we draw in the defense and kick and make extra passes, and then, then we do get to high-efficiency catch-and-shoot, standstill shots um, that, that we make at a higher rate than we might make at, as the – the pull up off the ball screen or, or, uh, you know, that, that, you know, a tough acrobatic finish where the, our ball handler got downhill and, and has to make a tough finish begin to think spacing action advantage spacing. When we arrive in the court action is our drag ball screen, whether it's side or wing or wing and advantage maybe for the ball handler or the roller, but quite likely it's going to be a, one of the three amigos outside of the ball screen. Mm -hmm. It's those dominoes that we talk about, right? Sure. It's the block, it's the block four, four down. That's going to benefit from it. It's not the first to the fall. Correct. So, yeah, and it's, it's the catalyst of the possession, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then the rest is the reaction. So the catalyst is the ball screen that we use to set the possession in motion. If you will, that's the, the chemical that starts the reaction is the ball screen. And, and the reaction then is, is, the, the ball moving to find the open player to combat the rotating defense. Um, let me, let's just start playing through the five, uh, playing, you know, te more teams five out, more teams Princeton-esque type offenses. You're seeing it even a little bit, quite a bit, as the uh, NBA playoffs progress sure. and now culminating with the NBA finals and the two teams using a lot of five out with their versatile bigs. Um, just start with, just kind of benefits of playing through the five and why or what has happened, the revolution yeah. of, of things kind of um, going more teams using that kind of offense. Yeah. I saw a quote recently that said space is the currency of sport. So um, I would say that might be one motivation behind what we're, what we see, especially at the higher levels of play of, of, um bringing a player that's typically associated with being in the interior inside the three-point arc be that on the low post or high post or something like that bringing them out 
And what that does is open up area around the lane for either drives, cuts, um, you know. So I'd say that's the main benefit is just trying to open up the floor, not only bring, you know, move your own teammate out of the way, but move their defender and bring them out. So you, you lessen rim protection and make it difficult for um, shots to be contested at the rim um, by the defense. So I'd say some of that's maybe some of the rationale. And, and as you mentioned, we, we, we're being um, shown um, in the finals and all throughout the playoffs of, of examples of teams that, that are playing through the five and letting, you know, on the screen, we see DeMontis Sabonis of the Kings. Um, of course, Jokic is the ultimate chess piece when it, when it comes to this. And then, and then Bam Adebayo of the Heat. Um, not quite to the level of Jokic, but sometimes he's an initiator out there on handoffs and things like that. And and so I would say that um, it's coming to to all levels of basketball where or in some some instances, it's already there of where you have a player who who can um, initiate actions from the five rather than sort of like be the the focal point of, of actions. For example, I would say we typically tend, you know, the, the way basketball has been approached in decades past, let's say is, is the five man is the finishing player of a, of a possession. They, maybe we run a pick and roll, hit them on the roll. They dunk it. The possessions over. Or we, 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 uh, we enter it to them on the low block and they make a post move and the possessions over. So, Typically, what we think of as our five man is they're the end of the they're the player who ends a possession. Well, what I'm going to present today are, are ways to use your five in earlier in the possession to sort of trigger the possession to start the action. So um, it's sort of flipping that that sort of pattern that's existed in basketball for decades of the five man being the, the last player to touch the ball to sort of one of the first players to touch the ball. Yeah. So again, this is one that if you're listening to this, you want to go and find this on YouTube, just search hoops form or radius athletics, and you can see the slides that go along with it. And I'll try to keep these slides as well. If you're uh, wanting to, to get these, you can reach out to me. And I can yeah. pass these along. Um, go ahead and introduce here this first slide that people are seeing, and um, then we'll kind of build from there. Yeah. Wanted to start simple and, and um, just like, if a coach were to ask, like, what is what if I, I got this five man who's, you know, got some skills. So where would you begin using them to, to, to sort of weaponize that and bring them out away from the basket? And and I would say starting simple with with dribble at. So what you see up in the top left frame is just a five out positioning. What we're envisioning is that the offense has sort of moved into the front court and five out. Our five man is is at at in the middle of the middle third of the court, top of circle, however you want to call that. Um, and, and we, we, the first pass we make is, is a pass to them trailing to the, to that sort of, um, you know, swing spot, if you will. So what's a, a very simple thing we can do to, to uh, play through the five right here is, and I would say starting with a dribble at. So um, what you see in the frame one is exactly that. What you would see maybe if a team was still sort of like getting comfortable with this idea is this player, get it, get rid of it and cut to the block or something like that. Just get to your home, right? Instead, this is sort of like expanding their role in the possession, letting them trigger some action. So a, a dribble at, what we want in a dribble at is, is punch the gap. So what you see where I've, where I've drawn that dribbling arrow, the, the squiggly arrow is um, – is intentional that they've sort of penetrated the three point line rather than dribbling wide at player four. They punch the gap that gets that defender there to sort of freeze causes a moment in decision. And perhaps we can backdoor cut behind them. Like you see in for in frame one, um, keep the, keeping that dribble. If the first back door cutter doesn't come open, we keep drip. We keep punching that gap dribbling at threes defender. And I, I should have pointed that out. We're dribbling at X four, not Four. We're dribbling at the their, their defender. Um, keep dribbling at three's defender. If they're overplay, we could get double backdoor. If they're not, we come over and give you know give a handoff. So this is something like if you were to watch the next finals game, you're gonna see Jokic do, Bam do, Sabonis did. Like it's it's very common 
Um, and I know some of you watching, well, I don't have those guys, but maybe you do have a player there that's got a little size who's, while maybe they're not Magic Johnson or something, they're, they're okay with a couple dribbles and making a decision with the ball. And what you've done is you've opened up paint for cutters. You've opened up paint for penetration. So, um, yeah, basic. I wanted to start with the basic dribble ad option. Yeah, uh, back to your point about I don't have the players for this. I think more and more coaches, especially I'm, I'm realizing the ones that are listening to this show and listening and follow us, um, they're using more of a I'm developing all players the same. So everybody's together. We're all working on ball handling. We're all working on decision making. We're all working. And you don't necessarily need this isn't turning the five into a point guard. But what you just said, take two dribbles to their left, two dribbles to their right, be able to read a defender and their teammate back cuts or comes and accepts the ball. These are basic decisions. This is not you need the MVP of the league to be able yeah. to accomplish this. Yeah. And like I have it drawn to where this player would be doing that with their left hand, you know? So if that's a, like, you could just mirror that frame and they go back right to the side they came from and dribble at player one and they back cut and play player two coming off the possibly double back door coming off the, off the, over the top of the handoff. So um, yeah, I get the mentality of like, of, uh, you know, this being a mental stretch for some coaches of like, oh man, like I don't, I look at this and I'm just scrolling past it. Cause I don't, you know, but I would argue that like, if, if we're ever going to become more dynamic at all, we have to sort of begin by asking someone to do something they're currently not capable of doing. <laughs> like if we're ever going to improve, we have to accept that like, okay, this might not go so well early on, but like, we've got to like throw you in the river. So you learn to swim. We just have to, at some point, take the training wheels off and let's do it. I'm going to come back and ask you about ideas for drilling and practicing and resources to improve the things that you just said, but sure. let's go ahead and get through the next one here. Yeah. So again, the next one, I believe what you have queued up next is going to be sort of an extension of this where in, in five out, I like to make things very simple for the big, because again, they might be, this might be their first time in their basketball playing career that they're facing the basket, <laughs> you know, like, and they're out on the perimeter, toes to the three-point line instead of, you know, toes to the back of the three-point line. Um, they're, they're, so one very simple rule is if you, if you have been past the ball, take it to the action. If you've been past the ball, take it to the action. So here would be one is past the two in the swing spot. And they're immediately, you know, we, they know what to do. We're, again, we're not asking them to be, uh, you know, Chris Paul or Magic Johnson or some, you know, super, super skilled point guard or something. We're just saying we're going to give you a hard and fast rule. When you get this pass, take it to the action. And, and in, in a natural five out setup, where might the action be in the corner? So what we're looking at here on the frame is a corner split. So what we would like the timing of this to look like is when one passes to five. So five would be looking at his or her right to get that pass to five. And they pull their chin and shoulder through to look to the left. I want four to immediately initiate a corner split with the player below them. One goes to the rim, one pops back. Here, what you see is player three in the corner rejects that split. The, the player four pops back. And now player five very quickly is one rule they're following. Take the ball to the action. Next rule is like either play to the cutter, play to the screener. Boom. And then and then if the reject comes open. We want that to be kind of a one-hand bounce pass off the dribble. If the pop, if they don't, and he feels safer to play to the pop man, we 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 can we can throw to the pop back man. And then now then, so what what would just naturally come next for that? So I've thrown I've already been on the move, taking the ball with the dribble to that action. I threw to the pop back man, like you see in the faint frame on the bottom right, is just follow that pass into a ball screen, which is something your five man probably is pretty comfortable with. And then roll into the post some somewhere where they are pretty comfortable probably already. So it's just a momentary, um, a momentary quick thing we can do in early offense to play through them and then, and then, uh, and then come, you know, come away from them, you know, as you see, uh, as this play would advance, if we, we wing ball screen and we throw to one of those four people, three people spaced along the, the weak side. So, yeah. 
and we've talked about in previous episodes the things that you can do with those three guys on the other side and um it's maybe a little bit more advanced but maybe someday i'll start putting all of these episodes together so that people can see kind of the building out of what that looks yeah. like all right next one here throw and go yeah so this would be um another example of the first pass of our possession is we're putting it into the fives hands to sort of be our trigger man our decision maker um one thing that you see pretty commonly is is the player who passed it to five there at the swing spot immediately chases that pass to to get it back. So the throw is the pass from one to five, that, that, that centering pass to the swing spot. The go is one immediately trying to outrun their pass and take it back. So by that immediacy of I know I'm throwing it to the big and I'm going to chase my pass, I might get a little bit of a head start on my opponent, and when five puts it on a platter and hands it back, I, I've got I've got an advantage for downhill penetration. Um, you know what I have drawn here. We've got the the player in that stretch spot, sort of clearing out to, to where we would have room to attack on the double side on the other side of that. Um, but five is the trigger man now. They've got the ball. The quote that I would leave you with today is if you've got the ball, you're the point guard. <laughs> you know, if uh, air quotes point guard, right? So we've thrown it to five and now they have to decide when, when one chases it for the throw and go, I have to surmise whether that is going to be a clean exchange that I feel comfortable of just giving it right back. X one didn't somehow blow it up or, 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 you know, cut through that gap to sort of disturb that handoff. Um, so if I can hand it cleanly, I will, but I have to be the decider of that. So I think a lot of times we shield our five player from decisions. Just go dunk it, big Johnny, just go lay it up, big Johnny, just go, you know, like we, we just go to the block, big Johnny, like we, we shield them from decisions. So this is pivoting away from that and giving them decision-making power. I, I see him cutting over the top, throw and go, but I'm watching his defender and they're trying to blow it up. They, 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 they've disrupted it. The handoff isn't clean. It's dirty. So they have to decide what we to keep it. So you see him hold it out. Oh, I don't like it. They'll pull it back and, and one just keep running over the top of them. And now they put it on the floor and play to the next guy where we might clear out another guy in the stretch and come over the top for the handoff with the next available player. So again, just, one decision. Can I hand it off or not? If not, if so, do. If not, let's play to the next guy. Keep and go next. So throw and go, keep and go next. I think I think that's not too much to teach to a player who's, you know, at least capable enough to earn a uniform. Would you say that these three are like the foundational ones? Like this is where if you have, even if you, you want to just start with something, these would be like the three go-to. I think so, especially if you were wanting to move to a five out positioning to where you are, you know, bringing that player, making a basket facing player. Mm -hmm. And I always try to start things with like, OK, where is where is a the basic thing we could ask him to do a dribble at a play to an off ball screen, be the passer to an off ball split or something like that, like. Uh, reverse and screen away, like something like just very simple might be some examples, but um, you know, throw and go simple. If then, if you can hand it off, do so. If not, keep and go next. All right. And we're going to go on here to the last few, uh, just a couple more options. So building on that. So hopefully we haven't lost some of the more advanced uh, coaches who have been using this, uh, this next one here, five playing more from the elbow instead of at a five out. Yeah. From the pinch post. Right. So, so maybe the first three frames are uh, where some coaches already are like we're five out or I want my guy facing the basket. He's, you know, we got a six, five skilled big in high school who can do some things. So, but if you're, if you still want to play through them, but you're not quite ready to make them a basket facing player, these last options are sort of examples I would give of playing through the five and what you brought up here is at the pinch post off the elbow. And this is, you know, common um, action in Princeton offense, but some people kind of run this as a standalone piece of just, you know, you see it in triangle offense, stuff like that, like a player um, in the, in the elbow ish area. So one is at the swing spot. They entered a five 
and and um, let's say they screen away, they screen away the, after one enters to five in the elbow. Again, our first pass of our set or our play is is to the five. It's not the last pass of the possession. It's one of the first ones. So we 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 enter it to the five, and and now they're the decider. They're the point guard. They've got the ball, and we run an off ball split like you see in in point away right here. And, and they're looking for the, the reject or the pop back, just like they are in the corner split. The, you know, we're just moving, we're just moving that action to a different geography on the court. So um, they're the decider. Is the reject open? Is the pop back open? If not, what do I do next? Let's look at the next frame and see what that might be. So, um, yeah, so if, if neither of those are open and I'm, I've got the ball, look at the split and I don't like it, well, I can put it on the floor and get into a dribble at with, which we looked at from a different geography earlier, get into a dribble at with, with, the, um, with the lone player on that side. Um, so we call this playing the other way. The action was over here. That split action was over here. Playing the other way to this lone player in the corner. Uh, might be where I go. So we're given our five who's maybe not used to being a trigger man, maybe not used to being the decision maker in a possession, a very quick look at the split. If not, play the other way. This can also be just be spin and go lay it up or spin and go attack, but it can also be playing with the next guy over in the corner, that lone player in the corner, where they might be overplayed. We reject into a back cut or they come over the top and we hand it off. Simple. But this might be a bridge for the coach who's like, yeah, I'm not quite ready to make them a five-out player, but what else could I do to play through them? Pinch post. And then for the ones who aren't quite ready to put them in the pinch post, yeah, the last one here, in the low post. Yeah, so this is their natural habitat, right? Like like this is where they're, they're at home. So the low post, um, we've, got, we've got them um, in the low post. And even if that was their natural habitat, but I wanted to make a subtle change to um, to get them the ball and play through them as a facilitator, make them the hub of the offense a little bit more often. I would change the nature of this post up. You see five in green there. I should have drawn it better this way, but instead of like your traditional post up where his his rump is in the other guy's crotch and it's a back to the basket traditional post up where he's only got vision of this like offensive right half of the court change it to where his butt is to the baseline and he's using an arm bar and a and a we call it a strong arm and a long arm and we call it t post position where he's posted perpendicular to the lane line parallel to the baseline and also perpendicular to his man arm bar him off ask for the ball with that outside hand and 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 throw it to that outside hand when you make it that entry and now we're almost like pulling them a little bit toward the short corner and there's a good spatial relationship for them to now be the hub playing through them in the low post where we can run a split we've seen th splits from three different geographies now so the corner the the wings the, the the off the elbow and now off the low post so they one enters to five immediately you know heads toward the elbow to set that split screen with three and now we're playing through the five, but somewhere they're comfortable with uh, that. And maybe the coach is more comfortable with them there. Um, so, you know, we get a reject or a slip and a, and a, and a, uh, and a, and player three accepting the screen. Um, so now we're, we're using them as a passer, a facilitator. And again, we're giving them a decision. We're going to run a, we're going to enter it to you. We're going to immediately, you know, we're running a split action. If, if one or three doesn't come open, what's next? That'd be on the next slide. You know, um, hand it off to, to um, player three and – oops, where'd it go? My fault. Okay. Yeah, so we want to give them something to, to um, quickly do um, if, if, there's, if there's, you know, that neither of those split options come open. So uh, there you go. So yeah, five, you know, three who's come who came around off that split screen, just keep running. And we maybe we take one dribble and hand it off to you, or I pass it to you and chase right into a step-up ball screen. I have drawn a handoff, a 
handoff out of the post commonly gets called um, commonly gets called grenade action. So we we hand it off right out of the post to that that player who received that split screen. Just keep running over the top and and uh, and you know just quick split or or pass it you know pass it to the player who shows up on the wing, step up for him, or hand it off to him. And there are a couple episodes that I will try to link down in the descriptions below. Split actions. We talked about that for about two episodes. If you want to do split stuff with your players in that pinch post or in the low post, both of those, uh, we had another video, a couple of video episodes for that. So I'll be sure yeah. to link that below. And that kind of brings up the next thing here. There's probably people watching that are thinking, I wish there was film of this. Randy, where is their film available of all this? There's film of this available on your television every night. <laughs> <laughs> like, I seriously, like, there is so, but joking aside, I recently did uh, a, a a post for my website radiusathletics.com um, entitled "Playing Through the Five, um, where I share videos of uh, Richmond doing some dribble laps. I share video of of University of Northern Iowa five out where they 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 center it and play to a, a corner split. Um, Tons of videos of, of throw and goes featuring the Miami Heat, the Brooklyn Nets. Um, so that's on my website. Full disclosure, it is a paywall article for rant members, but you should be a rant member. So um, there, there's there's where you can see some film. But I would say probably all the videos included in that article are on my YouTube channel somewhere. But being a rant member and reading the article there would just save you the time and frustration of having to track them down. Plus you get all kinds of other great benefits and help and, and knowledge as well. So that's, that's where I'd send you. But seriously, like just, just watch the game and look for, look for Kevin Love getting the first, you know, at the top of the key, look for Bam, look for Joker. You know, it, it's all around you. Just kind of see that. So we alluded to this earlier, uh, drilling it and practicing it to improve the decision making as well as the skills that go in it. Any resources come to mind? Um, yeah, I'm not a big drill creator guy, but um, I, I would say what I would do if it were me and I was interested in this, I would put pen to paper and say, OK, I want to practice dribble acts with my fives. Make a little two-player drill, you know, like throw it to our five, and he's got to do it with his left hand, his right hand. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Sorry, you, you teed me up for a question I'm not really prepared for. but um, Well, if I can remember, if I'm remembering correctly, I think you posted even about it this week on Twitter. Don't you have a 3v3 yeah, kind of small-sided game uh, drill book? Game yeah, thanks book. for reminding me. I do. I do. Um, yeah, and in that is often like – Drills we play what I call reversal side drills. So uh, reversal side drills. Appreciate the assist there, <laughs> where we we throw to the five. Maybe we simulate a drill that's three players of a five out. The coach throws it to five. Five's at the swing spot, and we got those two players to his right or left, his or her right or left. So that's the drill setup. We got the fives in the middle, two players to their right. If we're running it that way, to their left. If we're running it the other way. And we and a coach just passes to them, and and we're the other. We can do this on air, an on air rep. We can do it a, a three a three v three rep. But the coach just starts it by passing to the five in the swing spot, and we we look to the reversal side, like I showed in the in the fir, in the dribble ads in the corner splits where I caught it from one side of the court. I look to the other, and we just simulate those actions and turn them into you know shooting drills or turn them into little three man scrimmages. So like Randy said at the beginning, this isn't something that, you know, you, you need a necessarily need a drill book for. You can come up with it if you want. But if you want a little bit, uh, a little bit of help, there's that I created several years ago. It was more so ball screen. So there was it primarily focuses on ball screen and ball screen reads. But obviously there's some of that within five out as well. And, yeah, and I, I just like to take the 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 offense, look at it on paper and, and hold and say, okay, well, at most, at any one time, there's three players in the action, right? We throw it to the five, and we've got a little corner split. That's a passer, screener, and a cutter, right? So there's three players. All right, well, let's give me three lines and give me, you know, like, let's, that's not, 
that's coaching skills 101. Yeah. Yeah. So check the description down below. We'll try to include as many resources as we can for you so that you can go and add those to your coaching tool belt, tool belt uh, if, if it's uh, beneficial to you.